And through this, you are supporting Afghanistan good people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Prisad. I'm so happy to see you. I'm very, always very happy to see your smiling face. God bless you. Uh, may, I you request Professor, may I request Professor George Salazar to uh, say a few opening remarks? Yes. And yes. Then... Please. <laughs> Dr. Professor Salazar, could, could you? Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good night for everybody. I really appreciate to be here. Uh, the kind of invitation that Professor Kata has um, invited me for this fine webinar with this uh, excellent and most prominent expositors. And we will be able to enjoy a lot of excellent lectures. And uh, I welcome you all. And let's see the magic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. So. Uh, uh, May I request Dr. Liu Bun Singh to please introduce our first speaker and uh, 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 invite our first speaker for the lecture, please. Dr. Liu. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Sachin, uh, okay, for all the uh, minute uh, notice, especially uh, uh, Dr. Brian, who, who need to be here early morning. Uh, but uh, we, we, our first speaker, actually, we have invited Professor Wada. Uh, I don't see him in the list at the moment, but he actually shared uh, his video because uh, the, the webinar, the uh, theme for today is on uh, uh, surgical training. So we have the video sent by him on uh, bypass uh, surgical training. Uh, probably we will run his video first as a courtesy uh, as a first speaker, and we may have a short discussion uh, and if there's any question, we can always address him uh, through the email. My name is Kojiro Wada, National Defense Medical College, Japan. I'm talking about bypass surgery training today. Can you hear? Uh, yes, we can hear. Yes, yes we can hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's most convenient to practice. There are a variety of silicone tools on the market. This photo is the instruments I use in the trilateral practice, at least two fine forceps and straight micro scissor is are necessary. I usually use tensile nylon thread with four millimeter length. 3A circle needle. The position of the hands is important. First, remember to use your fingers as if you are writing. Let's talk about the stitches. The needle should pass through the vessel wall perpendicularly. To perform this, the vessel edge should be evaluated a little to provide the distortion. In this time, do not grab the vessel edge by forceps because once internal membrane injured, it can cause blood clot to form. Suture insertion distance should be the same at the whole thickness. The interval of the stitch should be twice the whole thickness. Put six to eight stitches for each side within 20 minutes. Let's talk about dry rubber practice. At first, fix the vessel with pin as you see in this slide. The main axis of the vessel should be perpendicular to the operator's right hand. A vessel is usually placed at 1020 on the clock. Prepare another blood vessel as a donor vessel for anterocide and osmosis. Donor vessel is trimmed in fish mouth. Cut 60 degree angle. Then, that side is cut.
cut linearly to elongate same length. Other stomy of recipient vessel is made by longitudinal linear incision. Lays stay suture on both ends and sew six to eight stitches between them. Here is the actual exercise. Place the recipient vessel at tendrenui. Cut the donor vessel at the 60 degree angle and cut the dull side further into your fish mouth. Place a stage suture on each side. A little stomach of recipient vessel is made and place stage sutures. Start at one end, manipulate the needle well so that there is no gap in the suture. I did six stitches on one side. After suture one side, make sure there is no back stitching. And stitch the other side in the same way. If you have an animal lab using rat neck and femoral arteries and veins to practice are very useful. The second case. Five-year female patient referred to our hospital with transient weakness of the left hand while playing the harmonica. Figure A, MRI flare image shows many floboid signs at both basal ganglia. And figure B, MRI flare image shows IV signs in the right hemisphere. Right carotid digital subtraction angiography shows disappearance of the right middle and anterior cerebral arteries and thick and distinct moya moya vessels. Angiographic findings suggest right side Suzuki stage is three. Left carotid angiography shows disappearance of the left middle cerebral artery and thick and distinct moya moya vessels. Angiographic findings suggest Left side stage is Suzuki 3. The right side was considered to be more advanced in stage than the left side. IMP single photon emission CT shows widespread hypoperfusion of the right cerebral hemisphere. First operation was performed both direct and indirect bypass. First, superficial temporal artery to middle cerebral artery anastomosis is performed. Then, galea with parietal branch of superficial temporal artery anastomosed to the dura. At the frontal bone, another craniotomy was performed and the dura was inserted to the frontal lobe surface and the periosteum was anastomosed to the frontal dura. Three months after first operation, 
right collocated is a subtraction and geography shows transdural indirect and direct anastomosis from superficial temporal artery and developed. And the number of basal moya moya, including colloidal moya moya, is decreased. Lateral view shows bold moya moya of frontal portion is developed. Angiographic findings suggest the right side Suzuki stage is 3, same as preoperative stage. Left carotid angiography shows disappearance of the left middle cerebral artery and the thick and distinct moya moya vessels. Angiographic findings suggest left side stage is still 3, same as preoperative stage. Second operation of left side was performed. Left frontal branch of superficial temporal artery was harvested from the skin and anastomosed to the M4 portion of left middle cerebral artery. The tip of the donor vessel is formed into a fish mouth shape. The tip of the donor vessel mark with a skin marker pen. Frontal dura is cut, arachnoid is cut and find recipient artery of M4 of middle cerebral artery. Place a rubber seat under the recipient vessel. Mark the recipient vessel with a skin marker pen. Stay suture are placed on both sides using 10 0 nylon thread. Five to six stitches are sutured between stay suture in one side. Then another side also sutured as same manner. After direct bypass surgery, Doppler ultrasonography, also in the cyanine green videography, confirmed the patency of the bypass vessel. Then, inside the left front temporal dura was anastomosed to the galea with parietal branch of superficial temporal artery. Another frontal craniotomy was performed the frontal dura was cut and anastomosed with periosteum of frontal bone. The patient no longer suffered transient ischemic attack after the bypass surgery. She has been able to go on to regular elementary school and keep up with her studies. The IV sign of flare on postoperative MRI disappeared after two years, and there was no new cerebral infarction on MRI after four years. Thank you very much for your attention. So, continue. Yes, uh, we just listened uh, to the lecture. We may keep the discussion later. So probably the next speaker, I will call upon uh, Professor Kevin Mark, who will tell us something that new to most neurosurgeons, not only young neurosurgeons, I think most surgeons who do not well familiar with uh, orbital structure. So let us call upon uh, Professor Kevin Mark from Hong Kong to give us uh, this eye-opening uh, lecture. Uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Kevin.
thank you very much, uh, Professor Liu, and uh, thank you very much again uh, to Professor Kato and uh, the organizers uh, to invite me to um, present uh, today on the topic of uh, surgical anatomy um, on the orbit and uh, therefore transorbital approach. So, um, well, I'm Calvin Mack from Hong Kong. Um, this is my hospital that I'm currently working in, actually with uh, Dr. Ben as well, Dr. Benton. Um, so um, this is a, a big hospital in Hong Kong, uh, over 2,000 beds. Uh, it's a teaching hospital. And actually, we're moving to a new um, neuroscience center in uh, 2025 uh, with a hybrid OR, robotic surgery system, et cetera. And we're uh, looking forward to that. So uh, without further ado, let me start um, um, the lecture of today. And so, um, so let's talk about the orbit. So as a Professor Liu said, um, a lot of neurosurgeons, which actually included me, um, a few years back, I know pretty much nothing about uh, the orbit, except uh, I know that there are two eyes <laughs> and in two orbital um, sockets, uh, which uh, neurosurgeons uh, really don't want to touch it. But um, bear in mind that it's actually made of uh, seven bones. Uh, and um, most of these bones are actually familiar with the neurosurgeon. So we talk about the frontal bone, the zygoma, the maxilla, uh, the ethmoid, the lacrimal bone, and um, the palatine bone. And also um, we're very familiar with the sphenoid bone. So made of seven bones. And um, uh, it is actually a pyramid. It's a pyramid that made of um, four walls and one apex. So if you look at this um, uh, rotund collection, he's beautifully demonstrating that there's an orbital rim and also the orbital apex, okay? And um, they're actually slanted outwards uh, laterally. So that's um, give um, the zero um, uh, tactic view of, um, of a human being that um, we can have a 3D sense. So when we um, zoom in here, we see that um, the uh, structure uh, here that is encircled in red is the um, orbital um, apex. It is an uh, annulus of Zin. And uh, here is the um, superior um, um, orbital fissure. And uh, here is the IOF, the inferior orbital fissure. And here is uh, the more familiar structure that we know that is the optic nerve and also the ophthalmic artery. So um, I think uh, most of us has, should have learned about this in our anatomy uh, lecture in uh, medical, medical school um, taught by the anatomist. So I'm not going to um, go through every detail, but of um, um, uh, interest to neurosurgeons would be this. This is uh, not very much mentioned, but um, neurosurgeons know this well, meningeal orbital band, which actually is the periosteal fold that connects um, uh, the frontal dura, the temporal dura. And when we peel this um, away, usually by craniotomy, uh, then we can expose the um, uh, superior orbital fissure and uh, then the ACP, the anterior clinoid process. So this manical orbital band is actually not a very well described um, structure. Some would say it's the lateral most aspect of the SOF. But actually, when I um, study in the cadaver lab, um, it's actually more lateral to the uh, SOF. So um, we can have a different method in cutting the MOB uh, to unlock the um, cavernous sinus uh, with a scissors or a 15 blade uh, knife, uh, which actually there is uh, no uh, nerve running inside the meningeal orbital band. And this is very important structure as well because it unlocks the um, um, the cavernous sinus in the transorbital approach, which I'm going to talk about it a, bit, a bit later. So apart from this MOB, this is another um, uh, structure that is of interest. So this is the um, SOF, and the green um, circle here is the IOF, okay, the inferior orbital fissure. So um, you can already spot the difference between the SOF and IOF is that there are a lot of um, crucial structures here in the SOF, all the nerves and um, uh, which are very important. However, in the IOF, there is a lot of space, um, especially over the lateral aspect. So this is one of the space that is um, kind of, I would say, overlooked by um, uh, quite a lot of uh, neurosurgeons, including myself um, a few years ago. So why is it so important here? Now, the, if we look into details, then we understand why. The inferior orbital fissure uh, can actually be 
um, classified into three segments. The posterior medial segment, that is from the maxillary struct here, to the um, posterior border of the infraorbital groove, which the infraorbital nerve that runs um, along. Here is the first segment, the posterior medial segment. The second segment is exactly the width of the, of the um, infraorbital uh, groove that um, where the infraorbital nerve runs uh, through, it exits here. And the um, third segment is um, the anterolateral segment. So uh, it can be classified into three segments. So what is so important here is this, because the IOF is actually a corridor to three different compartments. Now, the first compartment, the posterior medial segment, uh, when we put in a, a probe here, it actually is a corridor to the pterygopalatine fossa, the pterygopalatine fossa. Now, the second compartment here, when we put a probe there, it actually travels to the infratemporal fossa, the infratemporal fossa. And the third compartment goes lateral. It goes to the temporalis, uh, that is the temporal fossa. So this IOF, first of all, um, it has a um, shape that becomes from narrow to become wider and wider laterally. And it gives, secondly, a good uh, door, a pathway to the three skull base compartments. Now, when we take a look at the uh, coronal section at the histological slice, that we would see something interesting. Now, this is the ACP. This is the portion of the SOF. And this is the annulus of Zin, the um, inferior portion of it. Now here is the um, here is the uh, as, uh, the IOF. This is the inferior farming vein, and here you can see that most of the structures here are just loose um, connective tissues. This is the uh, pterygopalatine fossa, and here is an interesting uh, muscle uh, that is called the mullus muscle. The mullus muscle is a uh, um, uh, as a regressed muscle in um, human beings, in animals, in mammals, it's used. It's useful to retract the eyeball. But then, uh, after evolution, um, that in human being it become a very uh, 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 redundant uh, muscle here. Now, this muscle is um, actually of no use, and therefore it creates a very good surgical corridor for both adenosal approach for craniotomy and also for orbital approach. So this IOF is a corridor to a lot of spaces. Now we go back to this schematic diagram. Um, the, uh, this is the right orbit. We're very familiar with it. We're viewing um, anon. So um, the orange, I mean, the, the, the yellow um, circle here is the SOF and actually marks the opening to the cavernous sinus and the red um, circle here is the orbit apex. So the relationship of the orbit actually unlocks the door to a lot of um, familiar structures, including the anterior cranial fossa. The middle cranial fossa is behind the sphenoid wing. Um, lateral um, um, and inferior is the, eye, is the infratemporal fossa. And then um, more immediately, inferiorly is the pterygopalatine fossa. And there are different sinuses. Um, over the medial side to the orbit, including sphenoid sinus, the ethmoid sinus, and the frontal sinus. So you can imagine this orbit is very important to both um, the corridor to the um, cranial fossas, the paranasal sinuses, and also the um, skull base fossas, including the infratemporal fossa, pterygobalatine fossa, and the temporal fossa. So when we look at the anatomy, uh, this is the lateral view, again, uh, extracted from the Roton, um, beautiful anatomy. So after the uh, ACP removal, we can see that um, the structures um, running into the uh, orbital wall. So here is the lateral uh, wall of the cavernous sinus. This is the uh, third nerve, the fourth, the V1 and V2. And here is the optic struct that separates between the uh, optic nerve and also the third nerve. Now, there's an also another very important structure that we need to know as neurosurgeons is the ophthalmic artery. It um, is a branch from the uh, ICA, 
and then it curves first medially, um, to travels medially uh, with the uh, optic nerve, and then it goes laterally. So it travels medial, inferior, and then it goes lateral. So this um, is actually, however, uh, just the uh, most common scenario. There are quite a lot of variations. So um, uh, CTA and also an MR contrast would be very important with uh, we neurosurgeons or um, oculoplastic surgeons need to deal with lesions um, over the optic nerve. And um, the most important artery is actually the ret central retinal artery because it is an end on artery. And if, it's, if it is um, disturbed, disrupted, um, cut or having a basal spasm, it can cause a permanent blindness um, uh, to the uh, eye. So um, this is very important. However, sometimes ophthalmic artery can be sacrificed if there are collaterals. And um, if there's a tumor, for example, having encased the ophthalmic artery, that um, uh, if it's um, being uh, sacrificed, sometimes the, there will be enough blood supply that supplies to the central retinal artery and therefore the retina that um, will cause a no um, visual disturbance. So that um, would require an angiogram uh, to, um, uh, uh, to be sure whether sacrificing the ophthalmic artery would be possible or not. So this is another schematic diagram that is end on view. Uh, so we um, uh, are familiar with the um, yellowish uh, corridor, which is the uh, craniotomy. So um, the green corridor is actually by the endonasal approach. Um, it is good for lesions as medial to the cavernous sinus. However, it is not so good for lesions over the uh, infratemporal fossa, pterygopalatine fossa, and also the medial part of the cavernous sinus, because otherwise it would uh, be crossing a lot of uh, neurovascular structures. So here comes the concept of transorbital approach, uh, which is depicted by the blue arrows, uh, which is essentially a direct um, anterior access lateral to the neurovascular structures um, um, of the cavernous sinus. So uh, again, this is the familiar approach with the craniotomy, which is the yellow arrow. So this is the, I just want to point out this uh, uh, procedure, uh, which is um, 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 uh, putting a, a craniotomy blade along the infra, uh, inferior orbital fissure, which uh, is very important to do the FDOZ craniotomy. So again, the um, anatomy of the um, orbit has to be uh, very familiar uh, with uh, neurosurgeons. So we look at the endonasal view. Uh, this is the endonasal view that is uh, pointing very laterally. It's not the traditional uh, cellar, uh, view, cellar view. It's a lateral approach. It's uh, by drilling off the pterygoid plate. I'm not going to detail uh, here, but just to show you that um, uh, by drilling off the uh, pterygoid plate and uh, we can see the villian nerve, and here is the mullus muscle, which I've been mentioning. So here is the mullus muscle, uh, that is uh, the roof of the um, inferior orbital fissure. So um, the second part of my talk is to um, uh, uh, try to uh, have a um, walkthrough of what is an endoscopic transorbital approach. It can be also known as the transorbital um, neuroendoscopic surgery tones. It is minimal access and minimal invasive. Um, it is essentially an orbitotomy to the skull base. It offers a direct uh, anterior approach, and I've mentioned it's a corridor lateral to the ICA and cavernous sinus. So before um, we start, uh, we have to do uh, have to fashion uh, the skin incision, just like we do for craniotomies. Um, there are different uh, types of um, uh, incisions. I'm not going to details, but the most um, uh, common and easiest for neurosurgeon to work on is the uh, subbrow incision. In my center, we collaborate with the uh, ophthalmologist who is very experienced in different sorts of um, uh, incisions. So, but for um, neurosurgeons, if you want to start, the first one you want is to subbrow. Or you can also use the eyelid incision as well, lid crease incision, which um, cosmetically is better, but essentially it's actually offered the same uh, um, uh, corridor. So here is the lid crease incision that we do. So this is the right side. So um, we um, use the bovi to cut the orbicularis and all the way uh, to the uh, bone. So here is the um, orbital rim. So 
So we're not cutting other muscles here. Uh, so we, after we see the oblo rim, we then put in the, uh, the sector to um, strip off the periosteum. So in this case, we throw a little bit more. We also strip off the uh, ligament and the tendon here. And then we protect the um, orbit, we protect the globe, and then we drill the um, orbital rim to create more space for uh, the endoscope to uh, move around. So there's another alternative uh, that we can uh, remove the supraorbital rim. You can just think of it like a small craniotomy. It's a no big deal. Uh, we just um, um, uh, remove the orbital rim and then we can put some mini plates to plate it back. It gives more room um, and uh, maneuverability if we want to target lesions that is medial and also inferior. So the second step is for drilling of the greater wing of the sphenoid. So remember, um, the greater wing of sphenoid is here, the sphenoid bone. It is um, the um, um, uh, one of the seven bones that um, uh, make up of the um, orbit. So the first step is to identify the uh, manacle orbital band, which is the, uh, if we unlock it, it is the corridor that um, uh, gives rise to the cavernous sinus. So the second step is to view the um, whole uh, triangle here. This is the SOF and this is the IOF. And then we use the high-speed drill. Uh, we use a diamond burr with a self irrigation and we protect the periorbital to keep it as intact as possible. Otherwise, when the periorbital fat comes out, it would be a nuisance uh, that uh, we'll keep on, you know, the fat coming out and uh, the drill uh, may even catch the fat and that will be quite a, um, uh, a mess hit there. So here's the sphenoid ridge, this is the SOF, and this is the dura, the middle fossa dura. If we go a bit um, inferior, then we can see the middle cranial fossa and lift up the uh, temporal dura for peeling as well. So here is a close-up view. Uh, this is an extra dura dissection through the manacle orbital band here. Uh, this, if we uh, do the dissection here, then we can unlock uh, the temporal dura away from the periorbita, which uh, gives uh, the entrance to the uh, cavernous sinus. So um, this is similar to what we do um, using the um, craniotomy approach. Uh, we retract the frontal dura and temporal dura, and then we can um, peel off and cut into the manacle orbital band. And then in this way, this is the first step that uh, we do an ACP uh, drilling, the anterior clinodectomy. So it may seem a bit... Um, um, unfamiliar for neurosurgeons uh, to view the transorbital view. So this is the schematic diagram that I uh, created. So again, this is the SOF, this is the orbit, this is the approach that we view and on by the ETOA approach. So this is a dura. When we lift up the dura, we are able to see the macros cave, the foramen rotundum, the ovale, and then more laterally, the middle meningeal artery coming out from the uh, foramen spinosum. So we take a look at the diagram here on the right-hand side, lower corner. It's just uh, flipping the um, uh, transcranial corridor by around um, 60 degrees to um, 80 degrees. So the step three um, by the um, uh, endoscopic transorbital approach is by extra dissection, section, by peeling off the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Here we can see the ACP, the third nerve, the fourth, the V1, V2, and the V3, and more posteriorly, uh, we can see the macros cave. Um, this is the dissection I did uh, with uh, Professor Frolish uh, when I was uh, with him as, um, as a fellow um, uh, a few years ago. So here is the anterior medial triangle and this is the anterior lateral triangle. So after we open up the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus between the V1 and V2, we can see that the paraclypho ICA and also the sixth nerve that is traveling inside and all the way back is the Doritos canal. So when we go more inferiorly, uh, this is the area that I work uh, quite a lot uh, together with uh, Ben, uh, with the ENT surgeons and the ophthalmologists uh, these days uh, by drilling off the anterolateral triangle between the V2 and V3. Here is very interesting. We can gain access back to the sphenoid sinus. So it's possible to do a combined surgery because um, uh, imagine if, if there's another endoscope going um, through the sphenoid sinus, 
that um, we can communicate uh, by uh, the endoscope through the transorbital route and then also through the sphenosinus route that a bipolar surgery is possible to deal with lesions here, uh, that is the infratemporal fossa. So this is um, the um, um, mandibular nerve, the uh, V3, the, this is the anterior trunk, and then uh, also the posterior trunk uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, can be visualized as well. Um, so if we flip um, again um, upside down, 180 degrees, then we can see actually exactly the view that we can obtain from, um, this is the Fukushima dissection atlas. Um, uh, this are the VV branches, these are the uh, lateral pterygoid muscles. This is the lateral pterygoid muscle here. We just had a case uh, last week uh, with uh, Ben. Uh, we, we did a craniotomy approach uh, uh, by removing the contents of over the um, uh, infratemporal fossa. So if we go more lateral and posteriorly, here is the Kawasis triangle. Uh, here's the MMA uh, lifting up the uh, temporal dura. Uh, this is the V3, the LSPN and the GSPN. So uh, we go more um, medially and uh, interiorly. Uh, this is the optic nerve decompression by removing the ACP as well. So here's the optic struct after re uh, remove of the ACP. This is the optic nerve periorbita and the frontal dura. And by further drilling off the optic struct, we are able to expose the third nerve, which um, I've uh, shown in the um, uh, cadaveric diagram, which is uh, separating the optic struct, separating the third nerve and the, and the um, optic nerve. And here is the ICA. So um, here is the um, basic walkthrough of anatomy. I hope um, you can um, have uh, some understanding uh, of the interesting anatomy of the orbit. Thank you very much. So, you? Uh, Kelvin uh, for the fantastic lecture. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I've seen many of your videos and uh, your uh, photos of certain patients or the surgeries which you have done on the Facebook. So, I've been following your work. Thank you for the fantastic work you've done. Uh, you will take the questions now or uh, uh, we'll take the questions at the end? Uh, we can take some questions now. Uh, okay. Yeah, many people that uh, are putting them in the panelists, probably they can uh, on their mic and ask questions. Anyone, Dr. Chen, yes. want to ask any question? They have a question, Dr. Liu. Okay, I have one question. May I ask uh, Professor uh, Kelvin Mark? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, Chen, you want to ask anything? Please go ahead. Uh, I'm thinking it is very uh, complicated uh, to a young neurosurgeon. It looks uh, um, uh, very uh, deep and uh, uh, not easy to understand. Uh, it is not my <coughs> uh, knowledge uh, can reach out to it. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. I reviewed the handbook, anatomy handbook. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Chen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, so uh, I had a question, Professor Kelvin. Uh, although you are uh, advertising more of uh, orbital and transorbital approaches, but uh, we had few cases wherein the tumor was medial to the optic nerve, or it was on the superior part of the optic nerve. Uh, it took two cases. One was the intraoptic cavernoma, and one was the meningioma. So in which we could not go laterally or the transorbital, we thought to go transcranial. So we went transcranial, derooped the orbit, opened the tenens capsule and went inside. But all this, both these two patients had uh, partial third nerve palsy. The pupils was little dilated for, uh, for some time. And the, there was tosis, persistent tosis, almost for one month, slowly, slowly it had improved. So how to avoid this particular problem, Professor? Well, thank you, uh, Professor Chachin. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, following uh, my work and I uh, feel honored. So um, uh, for, for your case, is it done by a uh, craniotomy? Yes. Okay. So I think um, uh, probably it's the um, um, inadvertent um, either manipulation or uh, some transient um, injury 
uh, to the third nerve. Um, the third nerve actually branches off uh, with uh, two branches, the superior branch and also yeah. the inferior branch um, uh, near over the uh, cavernous sinus, also intraorbital portion. So um, uh, one of the way to do it is to um, identify the correct plane, uh, which is very important, uh, both for craniotomy and also endoscopic transorbital approach, um, even more so for um, transorbital. I myself actually do quite a lot of um, um, uh, open approaches um, as well. Uh, uh, so um, I would say that microsurgical um, anatomy is still very important. And um, um, also try to avoid um, um, entering the uh, periosteal layer of covering the third nerve, uh, which um, otherwise, uh, when it is entered, usually there would be some uh, uh, transient uh, third nerve um, policy. And uh, concerning the approach, I would say that um, um, even if the lesion is uh, medial to the um, uh, optic nerve. Um, of course, I don't have the images here, but uh, in certain cases, uh, transorbital uh, route is also feasible uh, as a minimal invasive approach. But um, as Professor Chen said, um, this is not a, I mean, an endoscopic a transorbital approach. It's not something very uh, familiar. Um, I started off uh, with um, uh, quite a lot of work in the cadaver lab. So um, I would say it's quite a very um, interesting and very promising uh, route. I would say it's just like maybe 20 years ago, uh, endonasal. So um, I would really recommend uh, to start off uh, with uh, understanding the anatomy in the cadaver lab. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for the excellent lecture and your enthusiasm for training the young neurosurgeon. Dr. Bain is a very, very active member of our committee. And thank you for making him um, and training him for a good neurosurgeon. Thank you very much. Now, may I request the, both the chairs, Professor George Salazar and Professor Fawad Pirzad, to make a few comments about both the uh, uh, speakers. Uh, first, Professor uh, George Salazar, and then Professor Fawad. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to really congratulate Professor Calvin, it's a really nice work that you are doing. And, you know, yesterday I also had a, a patient with an orbital tumor. So if I may, I can present some images very quickly about yes, yes, yesterday's Professor. procedure. Please, sure, we'll love to, please uh, feel free. Uh, Let's make it more interactive. Please share the images. I don't know if you are watching. Yeah. 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 It, it was a, a patient, like an 85 years old patient, that had an extra conal lesion, and actually was a, a meningorbital meningioma, mm -hmm. and it's an orbital meningioma, and you know he had a lot of uh, uh, diabetes. He had some renal problems. So actually, we uh, decided that we have to go to the actual problem of his. Uh, he had this exophthalmos. He was getting blind. So we decided to do a modified frontline incision, you know, because we know that we could do a very big surgery, you know, like a craniotomy and be really, really aggressive with the meningo-orbital, orbital tumor. But uh, in this case, you know, all the all the clinical factors uh, send us to, to be more direct, to, be, to do a, a small surgery, a precise surgery. So we did this modified crawling incision. Uh, we did the tarsography that I think it's very important during orbital approaches. And as Professor Calvin said, you know, we, we did go straight to the bone and, you know, to uh, separate the muscles until we saw the, the lateral ring of the orbit. And, you know, with some bone sews, uh, we started to to cut, you know, as high and as low as possible to gain some space. Because of the time, I will go a little bit ahead of this. We protect also the orbit, as Professor Calvin said. And we remove the lateral rim of the, of the orbit. And of course, it was a very invasive tumor uh, for, you know, it wasn't so vascularized at the end. And we started to, to the sac to protect the orbit. And of course, you know, to, to start uh, taking out the, the tumor. You know, I, at the end, you know, I, I didn't have the time to edit the video. <laughs> Yesterday's we did put the, the mini plates and, you know, a small uh, incision for him, I guess it was, you know, the, the smartest thing to do. You know, always we have, I guess, as a neurosurgeon, we 
fight a lot of what we could do uh, as a radical surgery, you know, with a big craniotomy and taking all the spinal reach and the, the, the tumor went into the temporal fossa. And, you know, for him, I guess it was only the, the main point to give some quality of life, you know, with, at his age. So at the end, I guess uh, he's going to be better. So that is what I wanted to, to share with you. Thank you. Well, Byron, thank you very much for a nice presentation. I think it's a time for minimally invasive, especially for elder person. Yes, maybe kind of the day surgery, that nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to um, congratulate again also uh, for the excellent uh, work. Um, I would agree a lot uh, on the uh, minimal invasive approach for 85 year old um, um, uh, patient with a lot of comorbidities. I would definitely uh, consider one of the options as exactly what you do. Uh, something different is um, I don't do tartorophies. I use um, corneal protectors, um, which I would think is, is as good as um, uh, tartorophy. And uh, we also, uh, from time to time, we check on the pupils. This is the reasons why we don't do tartorophies because um, if we put an endoscope, if we go to deep lesions like over the middle cranial fossa, and even we had the one case we did um, um, a lesion at the skull base. Uh, I mean, at, at, the, at the brainstem, at the brainstem. Uh, we, we entered into the ponds as well. And so we imagine the long corridor and uh, also um, we need to manipulate um, uh, from time to time. So we check from time to time the pupil size to make sure that there is uh, no change in the pupil. Um, so this is the um, little difference that we do. Otherwise, Dr. Congratulations. Dr. Colvin, thank you very much for a nice presentation. And uh, is it getting popular in, in Hong Kong? They use uh, endoscopic the resection of the tumor. Um, well, I think um, um, in our center, yes, um, we have done more than uh, twenty um, transorbital cases now. Um, I lost. Uh, track of the counter lately, maybe Ben uh, has a better number, but um, we're yes, uh, over, over 20 now in our, in our center um, over the past um, two years, uh, and we're getting more and more cases and gathering the momentum. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. May I request uh, Professor Fawad Pirzad to make the comments about uh, Professor Kelvin Mark presentation and tell us about how do you manage the intraorbital tumors uh, in Afghanistan? Professor Fawad, please. Okay, thank you very much. I saw uh, Dr. Ben as well, uh, raise hands. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, it was very uh, useful and it was good organized. That's uh, the uh, Professor Dr. Wada. Uh, this uh, was a practical training by POS. This was a step by step. It's very good for uh, young neurosurgeons and for microscopic who are the beginners. It was very useful. Uh, congratulations. And uh, the, also, the case presentation was very nice and it shows the uh, very successful operations. And Professor Kelvin Mack, thank you very much. It was transorbital approach and it, it's a, a good way to uh, minimize the complication of surgery. Uh, as Dr. Sachin uh, told that we, uh, sometimes we are faced with some complication as well. And it's, it's maybe it's be temporary, but and, uh, the Neuro ophthalmology, it's very young in our country, and we, uh, neurosurgeon and ophthalmologists, are working uh, together to make a team and uh, for neuro ophthalmology for some approaches and also with ENT specialists. Uh, and also, thank you for uh, Professor Salazar, at uh, congratulations uh, for your uh, nice uh, and successful operation. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, yeah, Professor uh, Ben had a hand raised, and then he's got his hand down. Ben, what happened? 
Uh, no, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Celeste uh, about his case. I saw, I noticed that there is an electro uh, attaching to the eye. Uh, is, is, is it uh, measuring the, the, the VEP uh, or is it uh, for another use? And uh, can you share with us uh, the, the, about the electro and, whether, uh, and some uh, experience in uh, intraoperative monitoring for your uh, orbital uh, cases? Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, no, actually, it wasn't an MVP or any kind of potential. No, actually, we don't, uh, we don't use. Uh, I think we, it's not a useful, you know, thing to do in in these kind of tumors. At least I, when we know that it was an extraconal tumor, so we right. did know that we weren't going to go inside the nerves or you know. But uh, I guess it could be useful in some other pathologies, and you know, for example, when we do. Uh, more extended and more aggressive uh, approaches, I guess it's useful to do it. But in that case, particular case, no, it wasn't, you know, any monitoring of the, of the, of the nerves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll keep the ball of discussion going, but uh, since there are two more lectures to go, uh, we'll take one lecture again, then we'll come back to discussion. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Ashish Kumar. It's my pleasure to invite him. Dr. Ashish Kumar is a student professor, cerebrovascular and endovascular surgery, clinician, educator, and vice chair, culture, intrusion, and division of neurosurgery center for neurovascular interventions, Sunnybrook Health Science Center, University of Toronto. And he's got keen interest in training a neurosurgeon. Today he's going to talk about how to train bypass surgeries for the young neurosurgeon. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Ashish Kumar. Please share your screen, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. Uh, actually, uh, my topic was today was uh, uh, training on surgical neuroanatomy. I think that, that was changed at the last moment. And, and we already had an excellent lecture on uh, bypass training uh, at the first, uh, at the beginning. So I will uh, share my screen now. And I would like to... Can you all see now? Yes, Professor. Okay, yes. thank you so much. So uh, thank you so much, uh, um, Professor Kato and Dr. Sachin and uh, Dr. Liu, who uh, invited uh, uh, me for uh, talking on uh, surgical neuroanatomy and training in surgical neuroanatomy. So I am um, very, very obliged to be here. And this is my first time in uh, one of the ACNS webinars. Uh, and, and especially in, in YNS, uh, uh, where um, uh, I have fond memories when I was a fellow with Dr. Professor Kato and uh, it was uh, back in 2010 and uh, it was a real, uh, it feels like a homecoming when I'm talking uh, in this uh, August panel. So um, I am a um, little bit about me. So I am, uh, I did my residency in 2010 from Bombay Hospital uh, in uh, Mumbai in India. And uh, after uh, residency, I moved over to Hyderabad where I was assistant professor till 2016. And I had uh, um, my first experience with uh, vascular surgery uh, at Fujita Health University under Professor Kato in 2010. I think many of us have been her uh, students uh, and former fellows. And then uh, I had uh, further training in neurosurgery at University of Toronto at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital and St. Michael's Hospital in 2013 and 2016. So uh, my second fellowship, uh, my first fellowship at Toronto was a neurosurgery fellowship and the second one was interventional neurodiology fellowship. So uh, that's why I realized uh, that probably for my own interest, I will, I will do a balanced approach and I will, uh, I will learn about uh, open vascular as well as uh, endovascular techniques to tackle uh, cerebrovascular disorders. Currently, I am an assistant professor at cerebrovascular, uh, as a cerebrovascular surgeon at Sunnybrook Health Science Center, and I'm fellowship director for uh, fellowship in advanced microneurosurgery. I will talk about that uh, briefly at the end so that uh, it can benefit a lot of students uh, and they can apply for the fellowship as well. So, um, this is my hospital. Uh, uh, Sunnybrook Hospital has been uh, there for uh, so many years. It was first uh, started in 1948 
uh, and it it catered. It was a veterans hospital to start with, and it catered a lot of patients from World War II. And uh, that's that's what that's how it appears. And after uh, I think in 1970s, it became a teaching hospital, and it now is the largest trauma center in Canada, and one of the teaching hospitals affiliated to University of Toronto. So at this uh, at the city there are. Uh, four major teaching hospitals through residents rotate through which residents rotate it is one of the uh, largest trauma centers and we do uh, we have a, a strong trauma program uh, catering to multi speciality uh, disciplines so uh, coming to the learning objectives for today's uh, session so we will uh, we will review the importance of surgical neuroanatomy training for the residents uh, we will also see uh, what are the modes of such uh, training um, from different perspectives across the world? And uh, we will see what are the pros and cons uh, of different kind of uh, uh, training in the modes. And we will also discuss briefly about simulation-based uh, training in neurosurgery. So uh, why is neurosurgical anatomy vital? Because I think uh, all of us, uh, and I've seen from the previous two lectures, uh, all of us... Uh, uh, basically dwell on perfect surgical skills based on perfect surgical neuroanatomical knowledge. Uh, I think that is the first step as a resident, which you need to know uh, where are the normal uh, uh, structures so that you don't damage them while you are uh, operating on them. So I think it's key for all neurosurgeons and trainees, irrespective of seniority. It lays the foundation of surgical skills. It makes you more confident. It, it makes you understand that uh, you know the uh, area where you are going. And, and that's why you will incur minimal damage and you will treat the pathology. So even before surgery, uh, I remember Professor Sano, uh, he used to drop pictures before the aneurysm surgeries. And we took that as a vital step uh, when we were fellows uh, at Fujita Health University. So he used to always uh, convey to us that, make the anatomy, think about it before, uh, make a, a mental picture or mental diagram of where you are going, where will be the aneurysm, in which direction it will be uh, directed. So uh, keep, always keep thinking about it before you even start operating. So I think uh, that's uh, the biggest takeaway, uh, you know, as a vascular surgeon. And I still draw uh, when I'm doing open vascular surgeries. And it, 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 is, it is very, um, uh, I will say, it has a calming uh, influence on your... Uh, on your uh, mindset and it helps during the surgery. So um, the common modes of neuroanatomical training uh, which are available these days include uh, the standard textbooks, journals, articles, which we all read. Uh, now there is a, a plethora of online uh, materials available uh, for the young neurosurgeons. There are YouTube uh, uh, materials available, uh, videos of uh, so much, so many surgeries by different surgeons across the world. And then there is a recent interest in simulation-based training, which I'll talk about later. Simulation-based training can be based on human cadaveric dissections, uh, endovascular simulators, microvascular anastomosis on rats or silicon tubes. Everything comes under simulation. Uh, then we also have spine instrumentations on sawbone models, and we'll have approaches based on synthetic models. And at the end, there is a recent interest in uh, virtual reality, uh, and that will also helps, uh, will help a lot of surgeons uh, in, in clearing their mind about the anatomy where they're going to go. So uh, this is a very uh, good article by Dr. Hawes. Uh, I, I know uh, everyone knows him. He's from Iraq and he's a, a very good friend. He, he published this uh, article uh, la in last few years where he uh, researched about the most recommended neuroanatomy resources for neurosurgeons. And, and when, he, when he saw, obviously, this comes as no surprise that most common recommended neuroanatomy textbooks by neurosurgeons was Rotten's Anatomy. And, 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 and as we saw in Dr. Mack's lecture, this is, uh, uh, this is I think, the, uh, the main backbone for all neurosurgery residents or neurosurgeons across the world. Uh, and you can see here, like it's almost 80% recommendation from the residents and as well as from uh, board certified surgeons, around 60% of them, they rely on uh, uh, Rotten's anatomy. I think every one of us know these approaches and these diagrams. Sometimes it can be too uh, overwhelming, but uh, it is so descriptive that uh, it clarifies your concept before you go in for a surgery. So 
what are the advantages? I think it includes uh, extensive curriculum coverage. Um, it also uh, gives us beautiful pictures uh, of complex anatomy. And I say it's a visual treat. And I, and I saw Dr. Max lecture about optic, uh, you know, intraorbital approaches. And you can see there were a lot of pictures from uh, from Rotten's. So it, it's I think it's a go-to book for most of us. Uh, most of us, and 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 uh, because of those uh, beautiful illustrations, and add to that the description which comes with each photograph. I think that also helps our residents or, or surgeons to uh, understand uh, the anatomy very well. However, sometimes it can be uh, overwhelming. Sometimes it can be a little ambiguous, especially for uh, those who are just starting in neurosurgery. So uh, they may have to be guided about, you know, what to read and what to omit at that stage. And of course, as it's a book, it will uh, lack a 3D orientation, although some of the uh, Rotten's uh, books now have a 3D glass so that they can, uh, they can get the depth perception. And of course, these are normal anatomical structures. And as, as Dr. Mack also uh, showed in his slides, uh, that optic artery, that the uh, optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery relation does not always go according to the plan, uh, according to the same route in each and every patient. So individual variations also exist. And these are a little bit, uh, you know, you have to keep in mind when you're uh, planning a surgery. Now coming to the uh, resources uh, online, this is, this is, I think this has been a, a new dawn in, um, in uh, neurosurgical education. And I, I thank ACNS to take a lead uh, in, in, in such uh, uh, endeavors because I have seen uh, and I see very commonly uh, ACNS webinars, ACNS, YNS webinars, uh, and uh, so many faculty across the world coming on and talking to the young neurosurgeons. I think that is uh, uh, that is remarkable. And and Dr. Hawes also thought that uh, you know the most common uh, source of uh, you know information for the trainees will be again the Rotten Collection. And Neurosurgical Atlas by Dr. Aaron Cohen Gaddle. I think that is a tremendous uh, uh, source of information, uh, especially when you are planning a surgery and you want to know the 3D uh, uh, orientation of a particular approach. I think it, it, it has a very nice operative videos and, and 3D and diagrams, and, and, and they can actually uh, completely, um, I will say, divide the whole procedure into multiple steps. Uh, based on virtual reality and 3D animation. So it's a, it's a must recommend uh, website for every neurosurgical trainee. And as you can see, these three, uh, these three resources are the most commonly used or preferred uh, options by neurosurgeons worldwide. 3D Neuroanatomy is a, is a website which, uh, which actually um, has multiple uh, registration options for the courses. And, and they are their long courses, they, they usually are based in Europe and they do it all over the world. And uh, it, it, they, they basically organize these 3D courses where they uh, do hands-on training as well as lectures. And it's a very good resource. I have still yet to register one of them for one of them, but uh, I have heard very good things about 3D neuroanatomy courses. This is what I was talking about in neurosurgicalatlas.com. It has a uh, it has a lot of information regarding neuroanatomy, 3D models, uh, lectures from um, different uh, professors across the world, and uh, operative videos. Uh, Dr. Aaron Cohen Goddell has done tremendous work, uh, and, and as you can see, he's the second most favored uh, online resource for residents and uh, trainees. 3D neuroanatomy uh, also is, uh, is is the website is is there. You can always access it, and it will probably give all the information regarding future courses, but this is where you have to actually go and register for the courses. So it's more like uh, you have to be physically there uh, wherever the course is happening. So these are like three to four days or five days course. And again, I've uh, heard all the good things about this, this course. So it's a vital source on online resource. So again, uh, as I said, uh, ACN has taken a lead in this and uh, I've seen Professor uh, Sachin, Professor uh, Liu, Professor Kato doing a you know tremendous work in this regard and and that's why it's accessible anywhere anytime anywhere can access uh, can anyone can access these uh, these excellent lectures and they can help uh, in 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 the growth of a neurosurgery uh, career. It's very convenient if you are busy you can always watch the recordings the recordings are available on YouTube. Uh, so I think uh, that's that's the biggest advantage. Of course it needs internet access so I. 
don't think in these in these conditions in today's everyone at least has in internet access but sometimes it can be a, a, a hurdle uh, for as i said 3d courses are physical courses like they have you have to be present there and and the registration fee sometimes are a uh, financial burdens on the learners uh, and uh, sometimes it is you know difficult to reciprocate uh, what you learned in a course versus what you see in a patient they can be two different complete different ball games and and that is of course you have to keep in mind um coming to simulation i think there's a lot of interest in simulation in all the surgical specialties and neurosurgery is no different simulation is defined as promotion of understanding through uh, doing and also offering the opportunity to merge theory with practice according to clapper et al and there was also a definition by gaba uh, which uh, which uh, conveys that it's an in instructional process that substitutes real patient encounters with artificial models virtual reality patients and live actors and learning activities can be made uh, safer predictable consistent standardized and reproducible so whenever we are doing any simulation based uh, workshop or training uh, the idea is to make the procedure when you go into a, a live patient surgery more safer you know the anatomy you are more confident about your approach so it's predictable it's consistent uh, and and then you can reproduce it as many as times uh, as you do the surgery again so history of simulation goes back uh, uh, to uh, 500 bc where you know you can see Achilles and Ajax play, playing a, a board game uh, designed for military tactics before the war, and and in Germany, uh, an officer uh, you know devised uh, Kriegspiel, uh, what they call as a war game, which it's a chess game which was developed in eighteen and twelve uh, for uh, for developing various strategies before the war actually started. So the simulation was there right from the beginning. They were planning for the main event ahead of that event. and and uh, and that is beautifully depicted by this paper uh, by dr uh, robert arader uh, in child's nervous system so gradually as time went by um, herophilus was the first one to start human cadaveric studies uh, um, when when he established the first anatomical uh, hall uh, cadaveric hall at alexandria and uh, this was followed by leonardo da vinci where uh, he injected blood vessels and Uh, into the cerebral ventricles with uh, wax for preservation and anatomical studies of course uh, vesalius had um, been credited for uh, you know uh, modern human anatomy and uh, uh, proper dissections uh, which 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 are part of uh, now medical education everywhere and uh, dr asmer ledel uh, was one of the uh, creator of the first synthetic human trainer uh, which was called as resusciani and uh, that's that's where you know uh, the the training on simulators on 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 physical stimulate simulators started so uh, simulation in training has gained widespread acceptance in many fields uh, recent years it has it, it started from aviation safety where pilots were doing the simulation training before they went on to a long flight uh, as i said war strategies uh, were were also using simulation and now it has also come into medicine so in all this is uh, basically uh, you know used in high stakes scenarios where mistakes or failures can have disastrous consequences and uh, in healthcare simulation can be anything when you are uh, when you are examining a patient uh, even on a, on a model a clinical examination model or a um, procedural simulator hybrid simulator live animal models cadaveric models uh screen based simulation uh, mannequin based simulation many people do uh, workshops for venous cut down for your know, cpr uh, for basic uh, life support systems uh, many patients do virtual patients in virtual environments anything uh, which is which which a surgeon is is getting trained on a model is can be termed as simulation and the types of simulators can be various types as i said physical models are where you are doing your practice on a on an animal specimen on human cadaver or synthetic models as we saw as we saw in the first talk of course there is limitation of biohazard safety tissue rigidity because they are all formal and stained and sometimes you do not get the real uh, hands hands on feeling as you are doing in a live surgery so tissues are more rigid but one of the best ways of uh, doing uh, you know complex surgeries later on is to is to undergo uh, cadaveric dissection uh, training and i think many of us uh, have gone to various workshops with 
uh, where you either it's for spinal instrumentation or it's for skull based pathologies or it's for vascular pathologies uh, where we have we have uh, we have done hours of training on cadavers so i think this is still the best model for training and uh, as wherever in whichever conference you try to go if you have a hands on experience on a workshop you must register for the same the second best of course uh, is is virtual reality which is basically uh, an image guided uh, model uh, and you need um, you need a special tool to visualize the the 3d anatomy which are uh, made after fusion of ct ct angiogram mr angiogram uh, dti images um, and again, the limitations are to like uh, to, to having uh, to have a difficulty in uh, uh, reproducing the elasticity of tissue, and and that of course uh, you are not able to you know do a, a proper hand-eye coordination between operating with your hands and visualizing with the uh, with, with your eyes. Uh, so that's why the mixed reality models. Uh, have gained popularity where you where people have now devising workshops where there is a physical hands-on model as well as virtual reality. So you are you are actually wearing those special glasses so you can see the anatomy uh, and well you can also operate while you are uh, with your hand. So it's it's the best possible scenario uh, short of uh, you know cadaveric dissections where you can uh, you know you can tr try your hands on on both the models together. So it it, it kind of simulates real patients uh, to the best. So talking about cadaveric dissection, uh, we know that cadaveric dissections are, uh, sorry, we know the cadaveric dissections are, um, you know, most popular amongst the neurosurgery residents. And, uh, and there was a, a review in 2011 where they reviewed if cadaveric workshops actually lead to effective surgical training. Uh, in in the conclusions, the authors definitely say that the, the evidence is limited because they they saw uh, they reviewed uh, uh, you know many such uh, workshops and and the publications which led to um, their belief that unless you do an assessment of clinical skill after the workshop, uh, you will never know that how much the cadaveric workshop helped. So. Uh, they, they divided all the uh, papers into three main categories where the first one was the studies which demonstrate objective assessment of trainees performance on a cadaveric model after a cadaveric session. So if you have done a cadaveric workshop, they will give you another cadaveric model after one week and then you, they will actually see whether your, uh, you know, your skills have improved or not. And, and there are many papers who uh, devise this on multiple uh, skills, including burhole insertion, chest tube insertion, and astomosis and K wire fixation for fractures and all. Uh, again, Bergeson et al. Uh, reviewed the pedicle screw placement in spinal surgery, and they um, they they also uh, kind of assist the uh, the skill component on a you know, cadaveric model. But these are all based on cadaveric session. So uh, the real uh, clinical assessment uh, was was not done in all these three uh, studies. These two studies, which actually demonstrated uh, transference of skill into the clinical setting after a cadaveric session. So once the cadaveric session was done, they 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 assessed the clinical hands-on uh, competency in live patients, and and that's why these two papers were most productive, where they they assessed the clinical skill uh, in, during the OR, and they found that there is significant uh, benefit afterwards, and and actually participants have improved technical skills after the cadaveric workshop. The least of uh, uh, information can be gathered by subjective assessment of trainees after they have undergone a cadaveric workshop as a training tool, because it's 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 a subjective assessment, it's a quality assessment. You will never know how exactly uh, you know the technical skill has improved in the OR. So again, that's why the data has become weak uh, because there were only two out of eight studies which actually uh, uh, assess the uh, you know the benefit in on a on a live patient after the workshop. So I think uh, this these things are are now changing and and people are uh, still uh, kind of uh, thinking about how to evaluate the effectiveness because conducting a workshop is one and conducting uh, and getting a feedback on it is important uh, although it is subjective but it still uh, means uh, a lot so whenever we conduct any workshop it's imperative to have a feedback uh, associated with it so that you will know what kind of learning uh, the residents are taking along with them so simulation in neurosurgery uh, has emerged because of you know the synergistic effect of two important factors and one of them is reduced exposure of trainees to surgical cases based on your their duty hour restrictions or probably most probably the complexity of case by the time we all were when we were residents 
the complexity of case increased uh, when we went from the uh, initial junior years of training and we trans, uh, transgressed to the uh, the chief resident position and then that's how gradually your uh, your exposure of complications complicated cases uh, started to improve and and uh, that's why in a in a 3 year or a 6 year program you still uh, do not access everything uh, therefore i think it is important to train after you have finished neurosurgery and again that's why such webinars and such workshops they really help a lot along with that um, there have been significant technological advances in imaging, computer-based graphics, virtual reality, and 3D printing in the field of simulation. So simulation, in a way, affords the surgeon and the trainee the opportunity to rehearse the procedure beforehand and take a practice swing before actually hitting the ball. So uh, it, is, it has come big time in neurosurgery, and we can see uh, various models where, which, which have a combination of, uh, of a 3D uh, virtual reality versus hands-on physical model. And, and these are the best mixed modality models where you can uh, train off on, on doing endoscopic third ventriculostomy. There are other virtual reality models where the surgeon will is wearing a specific uh, 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 gadget to actually see the, uh, the craniotomy and the position in a, in a simulated atmosphere. And as he's going down uh, various layers of craniotomy, dura, they can, they can exactly replicate the anatomy which they will expect in that patient. And these are all based on the pre-surgical uh, imaging, CT angiograms uh, and uh, venograms and MRI. Uh, so these are, these are very, very important tools to, uh, you know, um, to relate to the, the complex anatomy of, of one particular patient prior to the surgery. So, uh, but again, these are not readily available. And I think there are a few workshops where they do virtual reality modulation uh, simulation, but uh, but again, it's not a very common still uh, till now. And you can again see this is the simulation for the endoscopic third vent clostomy. This is the view. This is how it looks from outside, but this is the view of the ventricle. And when you are going down, and you can see the mammary bodies and how you are going to do the third vent clostomy uh, in a virtual atmosphere. Now. Coming to um, endovascular simulation models, I am an endovascular surgeon and I conduct a lot of uh, 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 simulation exercises for our residents and for our fellows. Mentis is the uh, um, front runner simulation uh, uh, company, which provides uh, these models uh, where you can actually um, simulate most pro most likely to the uh, you know to the actual uh, neuroanatomy of a particular patient and where the fellows and the residents can actually uh, go through the um, axis of the femoral artery and then they can go into the uh, intracranial navigation and see how many times uh, they have taken uh, to how many number of times they have attempted to access a particular artery how what mistakes they have made so these simulation models actually track your uh, your your technical competency while you are doing the procedure, and they can actually tell you how much you have improved in your previous attempt versus the the current attempt. So I think uh, this is very important. Uh, this this is the Mentis simulator, and it is it is readily available on on a on a rental basis also. And and I think this is the uh, top choice amongst all the endovascular colleagues whenever they are planning a simulation workshop. This is the one which we do in our labs. Uh, again, this is based on uh, uh, the, the physical flow models where you can see some coils being put in an aneurysm. And uh, this is also associated with uh, a virtual reality simulation where you can see what you are doing on a, on a laptop. And this is in the cath lab itself. Now, uh, as I said, there, there was significant uh, uh, evidence in, in favor of endovascular simulation. This is one of the early uh, uh, evidence I think in early 2000, this came where uh, they, 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 they did a pilot study on how the uh, neurosurgical residents, I think there were 10 neurosurgical residents, uh, and uh, they, they saw how, um, along with four neurosurgical fellows who were training the residents based on the simulator model, and they saw how they improved uh, with multiple attempts. So initially, they did a lot of mistakes to catheterize the, the vessels, but slowly and steadily, all the participants demonstrated improvement uh, over uh, five successful uh, attempts. So uh, th there was early ben benefit for um, endovascular simulation, and this article also proves the same. And, and after that, there have been uh, a flood of, uh, of such articles and uh, 
this was one of the earliest uh, articles and at earliest pilot studies which were done in the field of endovascular simulation coming to open vascular simulation and i and i again go back to my uh, uh, years at fujita where me along with dr chen uh, uh, from china we used to do a lot of uh, hands on practice on chicken wings and under we had a we had a training microscope and we used to do a lot of uh, uh, hands on practice with uh, with chicken wing models and you can see all, it almost replicates uh, uh, you know like a silicon tube model or it 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 becomes uh, it gives you a real time um, uh, help in in understanding how the arteries behave and what are the what is the tissue elasticity when you are doing these uh, on chicken flow in chicken wings um, you can also do these on um, on rats and you can also do I and mean, like i have been to various workshops where uh, you know hands on practice on uh, rats carotid arteries is being offered and i think this is also that's also replicates very closely to you know the stmca bypass which we did which we do usually in our practice and uh, as as seen in the first uh, lecture today it's very useful coming to uh, my own uh, workshop and we conducted this for our residents uh, last year at mount sinai hospital we did a hybrid uh, workshop where we had cadaveric dissections for terrenal approaches and middle cranial fossa approaches and uh, we we actually asked them to dissect and and get into the uh, optic carotid uh, corridor and explore the the anatomy of course the tissue is a little tough and it does not replicate exactly the surgery but it helps them a lot in clarifying their concepts about how to do a craniotomy how to plan uh, a craniotomy how to open the dura how to dissect and what you can expect in uh, in, in at the base of the skulls so uh, this was a very very useful workshop and we do it annually and again we combine it with uh, endovascular simulation as a as a surgeon i keep an uh, eye on myself itself because what happens when you are doing endovascular neurosurgery you have a you have a tendency to shift towards endovascular procedures because they are less invasive uh, but i always keep a, keep an eye so that i i balance both the open and endovascular approaches and uh, uh, make sure that you know we decide based on one particular scenario one particular patient what what approach you need to take if it's open surgery if it's endovascular surgery and i think in the next uh, acns uh, world acns congress uh, vns congress in may uh, one of my fellows and uh, residents are talking about how we how we actually failed in endovascular surgery once for a dual ev fistula uh, of anterior fossa and then we went through open surgical approach and we went through cavernous approach to to tackle it so i think hybrid uh, skills workshop Uh, is a must, and we just make do not make sure that we are, uh, you know, getting biased towards endovascular interventional uh, option only. So whenever uh, you have a chance of doing uh, both, you try to assess both because, uh, as this paper suggests, that the impact of vascular neurosurgery simulation based on uh, cognitive uh, knowledge versus technical skills. This was done in in uh, European Association of uh, Neurological Sciences. group and they conducted uh, this this uh, this uh, trial where they they asked uh, people to uh, practice hands on microvascular anastomosis and after a didactic session and uh, um, before a didactic session they 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 assessed their competency based on a survey same things they did uh, on on the practical hands on session and you can see these are the these are the pre didactic uh, uh, score for for knowledge based tests and that has improved after the uh, the intervention after the training similarly on hands on model you can see both for micro anastomosis and and geography uh, models they significantly improved in uh, the knowledge scores of the learner so i think Uh, both the uh, components are important in a workshop there has to be a didactic component but you have to make sure that it is short and it is engaging enough for the learners but along with that it's also important to have uh, um, uh, uh, a hands on session and preferably again as i said both open uh, cadaveric dissection and endovascular simulation that 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 sums up the, a perfect workshop so uh, to summarize surgical neuro and neuroanatomy training is key for all residents and young neurosurgeons you can go through books you can go through online portals attend workshops uh, multiple modes of training need to be you know acquired by residents as i said hybrid training is a must 
uh, simulation uh, is the future of education. Vascular and endovascular simulation is widely available. Do register for those course, uh, courses and practice and practice and practice. So uh, at the end, as I said, I wanted to uh, um, introduce you all towards this fellowship, which we, uh, which we uh, offer at Sunnybrook Hospital at University of Toronto. I am the fellowship director for the same, and we have changed again uh, this fellowship in uh, recent months, where we it, it's a, it's an advanced neurosurgery uh, fellowship where the first six months the the fellow will rotate through all the subspecialities, and the next six months he can choose two subspecialties out of the four, which include cerebrovascular, endovascular, neuro oncology, skull base spine and functional because we do a lot of functional stuff also so if they want to learn and they want to have a first hands-on exposure exposure before deciding their subspeciality i think this is a perfect fellowship so please uh, uh, you know reach out to me uh, via twitter or via uh, you know my email uh, it's available on the university of toronto website and if you are if you are a right fit i will i invite all of you to you know apply for the fellowship and and i said this was my fellowship when uh, when i came in here so i think it was very very useful uh, especially to have an orientation towards endovascular neurosurgery also now functional has come into it so it becomes a really good fellowship uh, i would also like you to invite for this cerebrovascular uh, international course again this is a, a course which my uh, colleague dr radovanovich is organizing and uh, this is this is going to happen in September 2022. Again, it's a hybrid workshop where uh, I will be uh, talking about endovascular simulation, and uh, um, there will be a worldwide faculty on open vascular um, approaches as well. So do register for this, and I invite all of you to Toronto later this uh, year. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Ashish Kumar. I must admit, it was the first time I was hearing your lecture. I must uh, admire your uh, enthusiasm for, especially in the field of training young neurosurgeons, the work you're doing. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I think Dr. Dr. George Salazar has got his talk almost similar to what uh, you gave. So I think we'll uh, take both the talks now and at the end we'll have a question and answer session. So, Dr. George, although I've listened to your lecture so many times and it is so educative, but every time, whenever I listen to your lecture, I want to sit and listen to it every time, each and every word, whatever you say. It's very, very educative and informative for the, all the young neurosurgeons. So I would request, without uh, making much delay, to, to introduce Dr. George Salazar, who's also a member of our ACNS YNS uh, committee, and he's the president, probably the youngest president of uh, Icadian uh, Neurosurgical Society. Over to you, Professor George. Please kindly share your screen and start your lecture, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sajun. Uh, I will share my slides now. Uh, do you look the the presentation? Can you look at it? Uh, not yet. We just have, we just see the screen uh, which has okay. the flyer for today's webinar, but the PowerPoint is not there. Maybe you can. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And now it is there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to thank Professor Yoko Hat and the organizing committee for the kind invitation for the ACNS webinar. And uh, as you told, I would like to share uh, some thoughts about ergonomics in neurosurgery. Uh, we know that the field of neurosurgery has evolved because of four main principles, you know, the mastering of the surgical neuroanatomy, the evolution of the operating microscope, the impact and evolution of micro neurosurgical techniques like dissections and repair of extra intracranial vessels and ergonomics. And we know that neurosurgery differs greatly from other surgical specialties. They are long surgeries with a high level of stress and surgeons may present work associated pain. Uh, there is potential hazards for injury and disability, some risk about musculoskeletal disorders and reduced career longevity. And we can see here, for example, that everyone is playing tennis, but at different levels and with different techniques and with different results. And it is evident that if we do not have an adequate technique, we will not have, uh, and we will not be able to obtain the most satisfactory results. And still in tennis, if we observe, for example, that some may have an 
an orthodox myth like Medivh. And even though it's practical, it's unnatural. On the other hand, beauty is watching Feder as well as Professor Evandro and Professor Spetzler perform because their technique poses elegance, glamour, grace. It's like watching the, the ballet and makes seem that everything is easy to do. And that is what we want to replicate. And for example, as the, the previous talks, there is a requirement for vascular surgery. And to become a vascular neurosurgeon, you need to acquire a different set of skills that are beyond the ones that you get as a general surgeon. For example, you need to get comfortable with micro forceps, with micro needle holders, working with short tenno sutures. So to get there, you first need to master some other techniques, like create strategies for reducing hand tremor, that is very important, to be aware of time and speed of the procedure and to avoid unnecessary movements, to choose wisely the adequate instruments and to think about exposure. So exposure, as we have already seen in this webinar, anatomy, it's very important. And of course, ergonomics. Uh, ergonomics is the study of the interaction between humans and their work environment, like machines and tools that optimize the user's performance. So in this paper, ergonomics remain as an unknown topic for surgeons. And maybe more than 58% of surgeons interviewed had no knowledge about the implications of ergonomics in surgery. And most master surgeons like Professor uh, Roton, Almefti, Spetzter, Juha, Professor Kato, in their first chapters of their books and revisions, they make special remarks about ergonomics in neurosurgery as a fundamental keystone to learn before performing a surgery. For example, we are going to talk a little bit about the grip and the instruments. The selection of an incorrect grip type will affect quality and performance of a task regarding terms in precision and speed. Holding an instrument with unnecessary force increases muscle fatigue. And as the grip time becomes more precise, the grip strength reduces. And we are going to talk about a little about bipolars. So the best grip is the pen grip. It is held by the tips of the thumb and the index finger and stabilized by the middle finger. So it provides an inferior stabilization of the instruments. And also it allows us a clean line of sight. A lateral fringe like this one has no inferior stabilization of the instrument and can obstruct the line of sight with your own thumb. We have to avoid pistol grip because it uses wrist and elbow movements. And what we want is just the finger movements. When we talk about a little bit of bipolar forceps, we prefer bayonet instruments rather than straight ones because it allows us to have a clean line of sight. The ceramic isolation concentrates less heat and preserves better the tissue. And of course, these finger depression or holes allows a precise manipulation of the instruments and prevents slippage from the hand. And of course, as the grip for reduces, as the size of a grip of the object increases. So if we compare the technique used in laparoscopic surgery, where very long instruments are needed and the hands are hanging in the air without any support, and therefore there is more tremor, less precision. And the same happens if we use very long neurosurgical instruments while working on the superficial plane, like, in, like we see here, no? So shorter distance to the skin demands shorter instruments. So this allows the hand to rest comfortable closest to the craniotomy. We, regarding the technique using the bipolars, uh, do not completely close the tips. There is a one or two a coagulation movement with an intermittent open close movement. So we have to avoid maintaining long intervals in a single spot because the vessels may stick. And of course, a, a careful cleaning of the tips. We know that uh, we have to avoid, like in this case, just using our thumb to coagulate because it will get fatigue. We have to avoid indiscriminate coagulation. Oh, 
Of course, we never clean the tips of the bipolar with a scalpel blade because it damages the coagulation or the insulation and the coating. For example, the ergonomics in our surgical instruments, we have to think about some uh, specific, uh, specific thoughts. Weight and size of the instrument should be proportionally distributed and balanced. The weight should not cause the surgeon fatigue. We cannot allow to see our hand damage after a, a procedure. The size of the instrument should be appropriate for 90% of surgeons. Surgical instruments should be designed for male, female, for right-handed and left-handed. And matte surfaces are preferred because their reflection of surgical lights may cause visual fatigue. Uh, when we use the sucker, we have to grab the sucker with a pencil grip, just as the bipolars. We have to avoid using the pistol grip once again because of the elbow and wrist movements. And this is interesting. If the suction hose is not properly arranged, like we see here with so many curves, it will happen this. It will move into your surgical field blocking the view. And we have to avoid this and set up the hose properly so it can rise and falls following the contour of your hand. For example, when we're using the dissector, we should not be, the dissector should not be held too far or too close from the tip. So if we hold it too close, like in this case, our hand will hide the tip of the dissector. And if we cannot see the tip of the instrument, we shouldn't do any movement. We have to use the convex part of the dissector over the nerves, over the vessels, or in this case, like the anus neck. And all movements are performed only with the fingers, with precise, delicate, and deliberate movements. Uh, when we talk about a uh, little microsurgeries, we know that sharp dissection is the safest method of dissection, preferably with under high magnification. And of course, once again, the tip of the microsurgeries must always be into view because blind sharp dissection leads to catastrophic complication. And if we cannot see the tip of the scissor, we should not cut anything. The cut movement must be controlled by the opening and close of the instrument. And we only cut only with the tip of the instrument, with the tip of the microsensors. And we know that microneurosurgery is a two-handed technique. So you need a firm pulse, delicate movements, and above all, to have the control of the tip of the instrument and a gentle management of neuro uh, neurological structures. I really like to use the, the paddies over uh, you know, uh, nerves. So I guess it's an extra protection to avoid retraction ischemia. I of course do not uh, like to use uh, retractors. I prefer an intermit uh, intermittent uh, distraction technique. One thing is for sure important. It's like how we made the, the sculpting section. And if we want to avoid alopecia, we have to tilt the scalpel blade 60 degrees instead of performing the incision with a 90 degree angle. This is called the trichophytic closure technique. And this technique is useful when you are harvesting, for example, the STA. And let us remember that young children and women are more concerned about their appearance and avoiding alopecia could mean a lot and a great deal for them. Exposure is mandatory for vascular surgery, and you may need to remove bone using non-delicate instruments like a bone ranger. And the bone ranger is heavier than other instruments and must be taken with two hands. So it must bite the tissue, like we see here, like biting the epithelium out or biting the catheter and, and not tearing the tissue like we see here in tearing like the interspinous ligament or tearing the catheter. If we are doing this, if we are tearing with the instrument, that means that the instrument is not properly set up and, it's, and it needs a maintenance. Of course, the Carison Ranger. We see here on the left, the correct technique, holding the instruments with both hands and making a biting movement. While on the right side, the inappropriate technique, holding the instrument just with one hand, and once again, tearing the tissue with this rotational movement. 
And we have to avoid this. This is not a proper use of the instrument. Uh, in order to avoid carpal tunnel syndrome, people are using pneumatic kerosene rangers. Yeah, it may help alleviate the manual uh, fatigue and soreness to reduce the occupational injuries and minimizes surgeons and muscular fatigue and effort. However, you can lose the feeling of the tissue that is about to be cut, and that could be dangerous. Uh, some thoughts about scrubners and delivering of the instruments. If the instruments are delivered with a bayonet downwards and open, it is impossible to handle and the surgeon has to rearrange it, which means removing his vision from the surgical field. So that is why the instruments must always be delivered with a bayonet upwards and closed. There are some strategies for reducing hand tremor. We know that the hand tremor has been described as the enemy of microneurosurgery, and there is a lot of common causes for this, like Parkinson's, essential tremor, enhanced physiological tremor. And we know that the amplitude, it will go between five and eight megahertz. So one of the techniques to reduce tremor is the finger placing technique. So the fingers form a unit. The hypotenor eminence is placed at the margin of the cranial to me to reduce the tremor. And the hand rests on the ulnar side of the arm. And we accompany that with short instruments. Of course, we have to avoid to keeping the hands on the air with any support because the lack of support affects stability. We have the quiet hand technique. It, it is an isolation of movement, and it is done by the thumb combining flexion and ex extension of the thumb. Another technique is the road hand technique. So this technique uses this device, the bedroom bridge, which is here, that is placed at the edge of the craniotomy and gives support for the first, for the first three fingers. So it has been shown that this technique can decrease in 30% the tremor, especially in the vertical movements. Uh, what is the main thing about this that I do not like, that I don't use this technique because this bridge, this device can fall down into your brain and can cause contusions. And what about if the brain is, uh, has a swelling? So this device can also be harmful for your uh, brain. And of course, when you bring the microscope, it also it doesn't allow you a clean line of sight. So it has been written, but I personally do not use this technique. Uh, what about the armrest? In this paper, some techniques were compared uh, with, only, uh, with only just the finger placing techniques without any support with the armrest support and the combination with the armrest and finger placing technique. And the best results were seen using the arm and finger placing technique with a little bit of flexion of the hands being above the air a little bit, the surgical field. So another strategy for reducing hand tremor is to use the non-dominant hand to stabilize the instruments. For example, controlling the depth of entry of the endoscope. Uh, about neurosurgical devices, it is important to know about our microscope. The microscope needs to be properly set up before surgery. We cannot start a surgery with a microscope looking like this. We have to know how to balance them. We know that modern microscopes are balanced with a push of a button, but all ones like these ones, you need to know how to balance them to make them function properly. We have to have freedom of movement in all positions. So the microscope must have freedom of movement regardless of its position. And connection cables must not limit any movement of the microscope. When focusing, normal eyesight surgeons must adjust the eyepieces to zero. But if you have more than three diopters, you can use your glasses. The interpopular distance must be adjusted for each individual and provides the advantage of stereoscopic vision. What about the handle? If the handle is rotated 15 to 20 degrees, the wrist is in a neutral position and it reduces the fatigue. So when the handle is in a vertical position, the wrist is forced into an ulnar deviation and can have risk of tenosynovitis. 
Of course, when you have the mouthpiece, you won't be able to use as much the handles and to move the microscope. But in a, some a, services, we do not have the mouthpiece. So we have to move our microscope with our hands. So if we use a better way to create more, re, uh, more strength with optimal tension, with reduces fatigue, that will be helpful for us, especially if we are going to do some long surgeries. When we drape the microscope, we should avoid draping and leave it too loose because it can hit the surgeon's head, it can obstruct the view and gets contaminated. When you drape it too tight, like in this case, it does not allow to move as freely as you need. And we have to avoid draping it with improvised drapes or globes or what have you. And the best option is draping with the air vacuum system, but we know that the costs are the highest. Uh, some thoughts about the ergonomic position of the surgeon. There are several reports that indicate the affection of the cervical spine, the back spine, and the shoulder level. And for example, in this case, with the mask, with this, especially this microscope, the eyepieces, they do not change position. And the surgeon has to modify his posture to be able to see, which increases the flexion of the neck and increases fatigue and neck pain. Of course, we have to avoid hyperextension since it produces greater strength, tension, and pain in cervical region. And we want to work in a neutral head position while working with a microscope or in the, nowadays with the endoscopes. If we use endoscope towers, the ideal position should be at the eye level. The ideal position of the monitor, it should be at the eye level 10 degrees downwards. When we talk a little bit about spine surgery, when flexed, for example, in these cases, with the additional weight of the lead vest, the sagittal balance changes, and there is a greater stress on the lumbar region. And we know that the vest can weigh up to six kilos. So the ideal position is to maintain a relaxed position, avoid cervical hyperflexion, and if we must, we have to raise the table higher. In this paper, it was interesting because it was done for general surgery. They use a front and back support as an effective way to reduce muscle uh, fatigue and contraction, which in the long term, it can be reduced lumbar pain and discomfort after the surgery. And of course, in this picture, we see something terrible. We have to avoid resting over the patient. We have to avoid the boot welder position that can produce a functional scoliosis, and it's what it's seen in surgeons that operate standing. We have to avoid standing and rest only in one leg. It increases the entire body load on that leg, produces muscle fatigue, creates bad instability, and of course, avoids using the pedals. And we have to avoid the hyperflexion of the trunk. And this is so interesting. If we compare, the surgical position of a general surgeon and neurosurgery, they are completely different. In general surgery, the table is adjusted in relation to the tallest person of the team. And many times the main surgeon, that in this case it's, it's her, she stands on racks and may be more uncomfortable. And the placement of the monitors should not cause discomfort to the surgeon and produces awkward positions. And we see here many times the elbows are far away from the body and the shoulder is very low. Or we are, as we did, as we say before, he's standing over the patient to see the monitor. And in neurosurgery, the most comfortable person should be the main surgeon. While seated, with the arms, hand, wrist, uh, with hand supports, with arm braces, the elbows are closest to the body and the movements are only performed with the fingers. There is an important thing about the sitting position of the surgeon. We have to keep our knees angled, the feet on the floor. We have to use comfortable seats, you know, padded, height adjustable and mobile chair. And we have to use a long gal because we have to avoid contamination. Uh, it is recommended to sit down during the intradular portion of the operation. And as we see here, you know, 
in this uh, third, uh, this one, two, and three pictures, there is a, a correct use of the armrest, the finger placing technique, and especially uh, the armrest for using a, with, for example, a APC tumors when you have to do some surgery when the semi sitting position. In these other pictures, we can appreciate that the standing position may lead to arm and hand fatigue. You see here how the, the hands are in the air without any support. The elbows are separated from the, from the body. And of course, there will be more tremor and less precision. It has been studied that it is useful to, reduce, to relax and reduce pain in the neck, shoulder, and lumbar region if we do some target stretching micro breaks, two minutes every 20 or 40 minutes. Of course, it is sometimes difficult for us neurosurgeons because the approach doesn't last 20 minutes or 40 minutes, and there are some uh, factors that cannot be done in that specific set of time. But we can schedule our micro breaks. For example, if we finish the approach, we can do a micro break. We can flex and extend and rotate the neck, the shoulders, the hand, and the lumbar region. If we start to operate and we have split the sylvian fissure and we are to about to get into the aneurysm, we can do another break. If we already have clipped the aneurysm or uh, retired the tumor, and we are about to close, we can make another break. Uh, some thoughts about left-handed in neurosurgery. In this study, several etiologists are mentioned to analyze the performance of left-handed neurosurgeons. And we saw that 17% of the neurosurgeons were left-handed and lefties had a higher degree of ambidexterity. And some reports about the difficulties that they had is that the lack of surgical instruments for left-handers and the absence of surgical training for left-handers uh, was reported. So these challenges tend to diminish in time while practicing neurosurgery, and better results in training for left-handed neurosurgeons were with mentors that also were left-handers. But we see here, as Professor Lotto, Chadal, Mura, Gadol, Juan Luis Gomer, Amador, there are no excuses to become a master left-handed surgeons. And let us remember that their mentors were right-handed. So there is no excuse, just training. Some words about pregnancy and surgery. We have to consider compression socks. We have to consider reducing the number of surgeries in the third trimester to avoid heavy shifts in the third trimester, to hydrate it, to take breaks, to sit down when possible and use maternity belts. There are some internal factors that influence uh, the performance uh, in the in the in the in the OR. We know that in neurosurgery there is a high level of mechanical exposure due to use of drills, plate, and sharp objects. That is why uh, I recommend to use two gloves for the craniotomy and one glove to the microsurgery part of the intradural part. And we have to change gloves every 90 minutes because of the risk of uh, micro perforations and infections. Of course, we have to keep our eyes on the surgical field and do not try to look for pedals or for the beautiful intern or for some other distractions. Of course, uh, the, tra uh, the translation, the transfer of the patient to the, to the gurney to the operating table. The, Patient transfer, it's really important because we have to have an adequate number of personal transfer. We know that, for example, that persons below 33 kilos, we need two caregivers. Between uh, 33 and 71, four, more than four, like uh, more than 71 kilos, four caregivers. And if it's heavier, the patient, we need some air assisting transfer devices. So, uh, some thoughts, the destination surface should be lower than the gurney. We have to take breaks, for example, one transfer every 30 minutes. And of course, as I said, in, in very of these patients, we have to use friction reducing sheets or slide boards, like in this case, or air transfer devices, like in this case. Uh, another thing that is really important, we have to avoid using the gel pad directly over the skin because of the risk of pressure burns. 
And I did operate this patient. I was like a, a, a cervical spine procedure. It didn't take too long, but you see here that I, for example, didn't use any protection. And the, what he had the most pain of was these pressure vents in the jaw and the supercellular ridge instead of the incision that was made for his pathology. So always protect the skin with undercast padding or some drapes. Also, it is very important as many, uh, to use as many pads as possible when the patient is in the prone position. Once again, we have to protect to avoid uh, putting the patient over the, the gel pad or uh, lumbar uh, position. And for example, in this case, I did put some pads, but you see here that the, the space where I did not put the pads, it got a pressure burn. So nowadays I put so many pads to avoid any uh, damage to the skin. There are some external factors influence the surgical performance. We know that alcohol consumption, they, you have a hangover defect, defect that can last from one hour to 24 hours. So don't drink and operate, please. Uh, regarding the duration of the procedure, we know that there is an increase of physiological tremor, a 25% increase at three hours and a 50% increase of tremor at six hours of surgery. So if you are planning to do some big surgery with a long time, you have to go in a team so you can change each other, you know, during the surgery and can uh, a little bit to take some breaks. Uh, fasting increases physiological tremor. And as my previous um, colleague did say, training is so important. So we have to have large volume of cases. We have to have many training methods like the such, uh, suturing, surgical gloves, elastic tubes, animal models, all the laboratory, laboratory training that is so important. We cannot practice neurosurgery in the patient. We have to practice in the lab. We have to have simulation models to live operation workshops, to operating videos. We have to visit other departments. We have to stay active. We have to keep operating. We have to have a self-directed learning and avoid an increase of administrative work. It is important to participate in Congress and updating courses and to be able to listen to the expert in the different areas. And that is why I really appreciate of what Professor Yoko Kato is doing for a global neurosurgery with these webinars and sharing his, her experience with the whole world. And we learned a lot in these webinars. So I, I suggest to Professor Kato that keep continuing doing this fantastic um, force, these fantastic lectures that she is uh, giving to the community. And just to, to, to finish, uh, vocation. Having a vocation does not only mean transmitting knowledge, but teaching how to build it with enthusiasm, come with commitment, with confidence. And nobody knows that better to do it than the parents. And you also see here that Professor Almefti, Professor Evandro, Borba, on their knees, on the floor, showing their philosophy, and that shows vocation too. So my take home message, we know that the learning curve is hard. We have to get mentors as many as we can. We know that the best surgeons focus on the patient and not the disease. We have to operate slow, but think fast. We have to be patient. Good results will come in time. And for me, the main two principles are anatomy and ergonomics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Professor Salazar. As I said, this is your lecture. In India, we have a movie. The movie's name is Sholle. Now, everybody loves this movie, and everybody, starting from the childhood to adult, whenever this movie is on, everybody will sit and watch. Your lecture is like that movie. Every time, whenever I see, this must be fourth, fifth time I'm watching your lecture, but believe me, every point, whenever you're saying, I have made mistakes in that, and I've learned from these mis mistakes. So your lecture is an amazing lecture, the way you have made it, and 
doing it is very 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 wonderful i would request you if you could make a small booklet of your uh, out of this your lecture we can actually you know send it to the all the young neurosurgeon in the soft form or in the hard form that can be a good idea i would propose you've really done a beautiful job so without wasting time i would request professor fawad pirzad and uh, dr kelvin mack and dr ashish kumar to make few comments about dr george salazar's uh, yeah. talk please dr fawad thank you so much you for your words huh. yes thank you thank you dr george thank you very much uh, it was really uh, best webinar and thank you uh, professor uh, salazar and professor ashish Uh, Kumar, uh, Professor Sachin, and Professor Kato, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it was good for uh, young researchers and also for seniors that uh, uh, we understand and uh, you know that uh, sometimes we ignore <laughs> some uh, uh, mistakes or some. Uh, important points and uh, it's very uh, important that uh, as professor ashish kumar told that uh, that uh, the uh, step by step from the neural anatomy go to the uh, box go to the uh, computer and cadaver and uh, uh, the lab and uh, it was very good uh, step by step as i told and uh, very uh, every meetings that practice make perfect thank you professor ashish kumar and uh, i i would like to also ask you for uh, also accept our young neurosurgeon for uh, fellowships and trainings and uh, professor salazar you make a very excellent lecture thank you very much and uh, it was a step by step and good and uh, you Uh, make very uh, good points, and for uh, not for young neurosurgeons, also for seniors. Also, it was good. Uh, I also uh, make some notes during you presents. Like uh, uh, sometimes we uh, misuse some instruments. We uh, some of our colleagues misuse like uh, artery forceps to giving the. Uh, gauze parts or the cotton and it make uh, the uh, it's a misuse or cut with the scissor uh, the tissue scissor uh, the gauze or the uh, cotton and it may make it not uh, good for be uh, used during surgery and sometimes uh, it also uh, position of the table sometimes it's not good and uh, the assistant sometimes and the standing position the uh, our stand is very high or very uh, smaller than us and uh, if you uh, prepare the table but uh, you are high and uh, the stands uh, may become uh, tired and uh, sometimes it's difficult and the other things that the sitting position some uh, surgeons or near surgeon it's uh, say that It's not good to sit uh, on the operation table, and uh, it's, uh, I uh, think it's it's not a shame, and uh, you uh, be comfort uh, during the operation. And uh, also, as you mentioned, it's important. Uh, one of our uh, teacher told us that during the operation, if it's long time, do some uh, exercise for your foot, for legs. That's uh, to return the blood and the exercise for leg and feet. And uh, the see your case in Afghanistan, unfortunately, unfortunately. Some uh, times I will uh, uh, share my uh, experience. That's the burning, burning by coagulator. That's the uh, uh, patient's uh, part. That's the earth part. That's uh, after the operation, we saw that's the leg of the patient's bones and unfortunately, sometimes it's very bad. And uh, uh, also, uh, 
some uh, some tables are not uh, good in, uh, in, in our country, unfortunately. Uh, good position for patients or for uh, also for surgeons. This uh, uh, we ask uh, if some uh, reusable or uh, 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 operating table that's also donates for Afghanistan is good. And thank you, thank you very much. It was very useful uh, for you and also for Professor Ashish Kumar also. Thank you, uh, Sachin and Professor Katu take uh, the time to uh, also share my experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you much so much for, for your words, for Professor Kawan. Thank you. Uh, I request Dr. Kelvin back to make a few comments about the presentation of Dr. Ashish Kumar and Dr. George Salazar. Well, um, I actually cannot use um, good words to uh, describe my um, uh, excellent feelings of these two lectures. Well, it's great. Basically, it's great. So, uh, well, um, it's my first time to um, listen to Professor Kumar's and Professor Salazar's lectures and their Absolutely great. So for uh, Professor Kumar, I actually um, would be looking forward to invite you to uh, speak to us um, in Hong Kong uh, sometime later as well, because actually um, I'm also in charge of um, the um, uh, neuro uh, simulation um, training in Hong Kong. And actually, I'm uh, we're setting up a, a lab um, in my hospital. Hopefully it will be ready uh, by the end of the year. And um, all the materials that you're um, uh, describing um, from the basics to the VRs to the simulators, endovascular open, and of course cadavers, which I'm more familiar with, uh, are, are fantastic. So um, um, that's a, a great opportunity for me to learn as well. And also for Professor Salazar, it's um, um, great. Um, all these, um, I would say, to be honest, are all these um, points that you've mentioned, we all know um, as neurosurgeons uh, alongside when we, we, we had our training, but um, it's my first time to hear all these uh, step by step, uh, all the fine details is very useful for trainers like us and also um, uh, for, for the residents. Like uh, I have the privilege of uh, Dr. Benton here uh, with the YNS and uh, I believe uh, he must be learning a lot as well. Uh, how to you know handle the bipolars? How not to break the bipolars? So Ben, if you break the bipolar, I will ask you to revisit uh, Professor Salas' lecture. And um, yeah, of course, if I've got the chance, I would uh, also like to invite uh, Professor Salas to to speak to us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Professor Mack. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kelvin. So I am trained under Dr. Balamurgan, and Dr. Balamurgan is a student of Professor Yoko Kato. So whenever I, I am a very tall person, six feet height, 180 centimeters, I always bend down. Whenever I bend down, Balamurgan used to beat me with the instrument. He literally used to beat me. So these are all the points which is very, very important. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rihanna is there from Afghanistan. Dr. Rihanna, are you there? who's a young neurosurgeon from Afghanistan. I would request you to make a few comments about uh, Dr. George Salazar, Dr. Ashish Kumar, and uh, uh, Dr. Kelvin's talk. Can you say Hello, something? Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sachin and Professor uh, Kato for organizing this webinars. And um, I would like to especially thank Professor Salazar for this wonderful uh, webinar, especially for us uh, young neurosurgeons. Uh, these things are not taught in uh, medical school and we don't understand at first um, about these things. Thank you so much. It is uh, very useful for us young neurosurgeons. And also I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Ashish for the wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rihanna. It's very nice to see you after a long time. Hope you're doing thank well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sachin. Thank you. Thank you. So anybody, thank Dr. You Chen, you want to say something? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. George Salazar. It's a very wonderful and a successful uh, presentation. 
uh, I learned a lot from your from you and your uh, lecture. Uh, when uh, uh, this is really a uh, like a big movie, a fantastic <laughs> movie. Um, in my mind, when I watch your lecture, I think uh, uh, detail detail uh, make the decision if we can successful or not. Uh, there is so much uh, detail. I I I hope uh, uh, this uh, I can uh, uh, watch again and again. Uh, this uh, webinar record, uh, I can review every uh, uh, details. And uh, I was a uh, um, general surgeon for five year, years. In our hospital, I can uh, training my technique, basic uh, operation technique uh, in general surgery. So I almost uh, uh, familiar every uh, operation detail. But in neurosurgery, I think many uh, different uh, and high skill uh, high than uh, general surgery. Um, even in our, uh, our operation room, our senior chief neurosurgeon cannot uh, um, notice the detail and uh, the post, such like uh, posture, uh, comfortable, um, and, the, uh, and the, uh, Caesar, uh, a Caesar, a typical tip, uh, tip, the tip, uh, the technique. So uh, I hope I can share this uh, video with my uh, uh, colleagues and the medical students. Okay, and uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, almost. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. I learned a lot every time, and uh, I'm my pre uh, uh, very pleasure uh, to see you all again and again. <laughs> thank you so much, and uh, Dr. Kato and uh, Dr. Sashin, and uh, Pizad. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank much, you, Dr. Chen. Thank you. So, I uh, hope so, I can visit your hospital and uh, uh, watch your operation in person. Sure, sure. We all want to meet each other because COVID is the one who's holding us. Hopefully, we'll be able to see each other. So now we've finished with the four talks, and we have, we still have one more talk, uh, the YNS speaker. So we have Dr. Ben NG from Hong Kong, a very enthusiastic, good friend of mine. He's my younger brother who's helping me all the time. And he's also a member of ACNS YNS committee uh, who's training under Dr. Kelvin Mark. So it's actually a very good uh, day today for a mentor and mentee to be together and discuss on the same topic. So may I invite, without wasting a time, Dr. Ben NG, who's going to have a small case presentation on transorbital surgery. Over to you, Dr. Ben, start the presentation. Can you uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So uh, yes, uh, uh, good evening, uh, seniors and colleagues, and I would like to thank uh, Professor Yoko Kato, Liu, and Sanchen for uh, for the invitation uh, for uh, for me to present in this uh, in this uh, seminar. So as mentioned by uh, Professor Chen, uh, is a very um, uh, the anatomy is quite difficult to understand for the transorbital approach. So I would like to share some cases uh, so that um, so that um, you guys can have a more uh, understanding of it, and, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, we we'll make it uh, more easy to understand the anatomy. So um, so uh, endoscopic transorbital surgery is a minimally invasive approach, skull based in a direct anterior fashion using the endoscope. And uh, since 2020, we have performed more than 20 cases in our institutes. So it was first reported by Mo in 2010 that it is designed to overcome the difficulties in endolasal surgery for orbital and scalp bay lesions. It provided an additional route for lesions that cannot be solely tackled by translational or transoral surgery. As an alternative to craniotomy, it provided minimal mobility, better cosmetic results, and minimal brain rejection. And we started to perform ETOA in 2020 and currently more than 20 cases. So after it's a report, uh, it was reported in 2010. In, in 2018, Kong reported that uh, with an ETOA with a lateral orbitotomy for the spinal orbital meningioma, it could achieve a better gross total resection. So in 2021, the orbital retraction uh, uh, of more than 1.5 cm could lead to dramatic increase in intraocular uh, pressure. 
So uh, this to basically to remind the audience of the steps presented uh, in, uh, in Kelvin's lecture. So we firstly is to uh, make a, a liquid incision. We could perform a craniotomy after the incision. Uh, uh, we could perform the orbitotomy after the incision. And then we could uh, afterwards strip off the, uh, strip off the periorbital away from the bone. And then uh, we could uh, open the space to find the superior orbital fissure. And then uh, we could divide the remaining orbital band. And then we would drill the sphenoid wing to expose the temporal dura. And then afterward, we could wish the anterior cavernous sinus wall and the endolateral triangle could be identified. There is some uh, intraoperative photos demonstrating the import, uh, the, the view of the endolateral triangle. So this is the temporal dura, this is the uh, V2, and this is the V3. So after the drilling of the uh, of the sphenoid wing and splitting of the uh, anterior wall of the cavernous sizes, we could uh, reach this triangle. But why is this uh, important? Because as shown in, the, in this uh, uh, illustration, so this is the corridor that uh, we could drill in order to reach the eustachian tube and also the viridian nerve and also the ICA. Uh, sometimes uh, for some deep seated skull based tumor, uh, this space is uh, quite difficult to reach uh, by traditional uh, route. So uh, as mentioned before, it's also important to minimize the retraction uh, in the surgery. So uh, we also studied uh, uh, the effect of the uh, op uh, orbitotomy on the surgical freedom in, uh, uh, and the angle of attacks. So I would, uh, I would like to share more of it uh, about the study in the coming YNS Congress. But in essence, so with the orbitotomy, so uh, we could achieve a greater angle of attack and also a, a greater surgical freedom. So here is the, a short video uh, summarizing the steps of the transorbital uh, surgery. So um, this is a short version of the review uh, of a case published in uh, uh, Rolio Surgery. It's a case of an orbital apex cavernous hemangioma. So you can see this is a pre uh, MRI. So there's a lesion, and you could, we could uh, make a, a liquid incision to expose the, uh, the lateral orbital rim, which is cut later on. And then we could expose the space where we could strip the periorbital, find the superior orbital fissure, divide the meningo orbital band. And then we could drill the uh, sphenoid wing to expose the temporal dura. And in this case, we use the ICG to help identification of the lesion. And then finally, we could uh, dissect this orbital apex lesion uh, through this approach. And then uh, we, we construct uh, using the uh, minipate, uh, which uh, also yield a good cosmetic result. So the case of focus today would be a, a 64 year old gentleman who is an ex smoker, ex drinker with a past self of hypertension. He's working as a manual worker and was a referred from ophthalmologist for left six left palsy for one year. When he presented with dipropia or natural gaze, there's no facial numbness, no redness, and the vision was essentially uh, normal. So on physical examination, the neurological examination was essentially normal, except there is a left uh, six left palsy. So this is the preoperative uh, CT scan. So you can appreciate that uh, there is a more uh, hyper intense uh, uh, signal uh, or at, um, at the left side of cavernous sinus. And this is the MRI uh, TOF with contrast showing there is a heterogeneous enhancing lesion at the left side of cavernous sinus. And this is the uh, T2 sequence. So, um, this is the, um, I would like to familiarize uh, and orientate the audience. So this side would be the periorbital, whereas this side would be the, uh, the temporal dura side and also the sphenoid wing side. So we're, we have just uh, split uh, the periorbital and uh, starting from here, we would uh, divide the meningo orbital band and we could uh, further drill the sphenoid wing in order to expose the temporal dura. So by opening the space between the, uh, the preorbiter and the temporal dura, we could reach the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus where we could uh, find the uh, lesions. So I appreciate some, there is some uh, weakness bleeding from the cavernous sinus. 
and uh, by ex by uh, hemostasis and the, the tumor could be exposed. So the excision of the tumor, uh, we, we just use the technique of uh, traditional craniotomy. We firstly cauterize the tumor, followed by the tumor debulking. And then finally, we try to dissect the tumor capsule from the surrounding coronus, sinus, trabeculae, and also the fifth left uh, fibers. So we are trying to dissect the tumor capsule from the uh, trigeminal fibers and also the terminal sinus trabeculation. So you can see we try to encircle the whole um, uh, tumor capsule to try to dissect it as a piece. And that the, you can see there are some uh, small uh, disease woodlets coming from the trigeminal left uh, attaching to the tumor capsule. So uh, we try to encircle the tumor gradually. And then at the end, we can see there is a small uh, disease that would give rise to this uh, tumor. In, in that way, we could uh, minimize the trauma to the whole trigeminal left and we just cut the disease root left here. And then finally, the tumor was uh, resetted as a whole. So we can appreciate the surgical cavity. There is a small uh, CSF leak and we repair it uh, using a dual allograph, the dual gen in, uh, in this case, followed by a tissue glue. This is the uh, post-op, uh, uh, this is the uh, wound after the excision of tumor. And again, the wound uh, would be uh, repaired by, the, by our oculoplastic uh, surgeons. So uh, postoperatively, there is a low CSF leak and there's a gradual improving uh, sex uh, policy at six month time. For the left eye, it could reach nearly full abduction and the vision was essentially similar to PO. There is mild uh, V1 numbness and the final pathology confirmed scrotoma. So this is the post-op uh, CT uh, scan. So uh, as shown here, you can view that uh, the transorbital approach is actually approaching the tumor in a direct anterior fashion. You appreciate the root here. So we have drew off this part of the sphenoid wing in order to reach this uh, part of the, uh, the cavernous sinus whereas the tumor uh, was uh, reset from it. And the post-op MRI show there is uh, no gross uh, residual. So in conclusion, ETOA is an alternative to craniotomy for orbital and skull-based pathologies. It's minimally invasive with minimal morbidities and better cosmetic results. Complication can be avoided by minimizing the rejection. By orbitotomy, the angle of attack and surgical freedom could be increased, and orbitotomy can be tailor-made according to individual cases. Last but not least, I would like to uh, thank the multidisciplinary skull-based team of our hospital uh, for uh, this uh, great uh, surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Penn. That was an excellent case. Without wasting the time, I think uh, the best person to discuss this case would be your vendor. So I would propose few points for the discussion and then we'll have a discussion. For this particular kind of a case, uh, what was your preoperative diagnosis? And based on that, why did you choose this approach and not a transcranial approach where you can have a better hemostatic uh, uh, better uh, hand for the blood control, for the bleeding control, one thing. Second thing, uh, do you give any sort of methylprednisolone or anything? Because there would be a lot of optic nerve compression when you are actually deroofing the optic canal at the optic strut. Third thing, if at all there is any advertent uh, uh, injury to the orbital uh, tenons capsule and the fat comes out, what is the way out? Do you just push that fat inside or is it okay to take out some fat? And uh, 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 fourth thing, what was the post-operative diagnosis? 
So uh, I would request Professor Kelvin Mack to make the comments about this thing, although you were the part of the team, but I think you're the best person here because you are expertised into this particular kind of surgery. Over to you, Professor. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Ben, for the uh, presentation, and um, um, it's great. So, uh, well, this is a case of um, um, trigeminal um, schwannoma. So, uh, this actually um, is the preoperative diagnosis, and it also correlates well with the um, histology and pathology as well um, as the post-op. So, that's the first and the fourth question. So, um, regarding the approach, um, of course, the craniotomy and actually the endonasal approach is also are also two um, quite um, feasible alternatives. Um, as said, actually, I'm not um, um, just an endoscopic uh, surgeon, but I do a lot of open craniotomies, craniotomies as well. So um, for this case, I would say, uh, to be fair, uh, that um, um, endonasal approach and also craniotomy uh, would be good uh, alternatives as well. The reason why this case we pick um, endoscopic transorbital approach is uh, first of all, so we have experience. Um, this is not the first case that we did. The first case that we did is actually, it's a sphenoorbital meningioma. It's a straight route um, through the orbit that drove off the bone, similar um, to the case that is shown um, 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 uh, by um, Professor Sellers as well. So um, that's um, uh, quite a good case to start off. And then we gain experience uh, by dissecting the um, lateral cavernous sinus wall. And uh, we feel that it is um, a good approach uh, when we compare it to um, craniotomy and also endonasal because the route is very uh, direct. It is a direct anterior approach. And um, we actually also measure the distance from the skin uh, to the lesion. And it's quite um, intuitive that this is the shortest route uh, possible to uh, reach the lesion from the orbit. Um, well, it's kind of similar to craniotomy because the, you, you see the, the axis just swing laterally, but then that would involve a scarf incision, all the hair follicles issue, the temporalis atrophy, uh, um, the craniotomy issues, etc. So that's why in this case, uh, we, we pick um, endonasal, I mean, uh, endoscopic or transorbital route. And we also look carefully uh, if there's any uh, breaching of the borders. Um, it does not um, invade um, into the, or involve the posterior uh, cranial fossa. It uh, just stays um, at the um, middle cranial fossa. So that is a good case as well. That is not too difficult. And um, it also has an advantage if we talk about um, uh, minimal invasive. So another argument would be doing endonasal. The good advantage is that there is um, almost um, um, almost zero chance of uh, having CSF leak. When compared to endonasal approach, uh, of course, you, 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 have, you can uh, repair the dura, uh, you can use nasal septal flap, fat what that whatsoever, but then it opens into the paranasal sinus. So there will be chance of CSF leak. And you know, neurosurgeons would be quite um, um, agitated and scared um, in the first uh, couple of days after the kind of case we do endonasal. Whereas for um, transorbital, because um, it is not a um, natural space, we create the space. And um, when we finish off the surgery, there is a no uh, connection of the, um, of the op operative field to any paranasal sinus. So when we just stitch off the wound um, the, and also the periorbital, we just um, compress back uh, because there is um, intraorbital pressure. So it will just automatically look like a, a seal. It seals off the pressure. And um, finally, and the third question is about the, um, the optic nerve. Now, uh, for this case, we do not drill near the optic struct. Uh, it is not necessary. Uh, we just drill the greater wing of the sphenoid. We enter the correct plane, which is very important to uh, dissect the uh, lateral um, wall of the calf in the sinus. So in this manner, we do not expose any nerve. And um, we do the drilling with uh, irrigation all the time, uh, which is important to lower the chance of the thermal injury to surrounding nerves like the third or even the optic. And last of all, we um, intermittently release the, uh, um, the uh, pressure to the right. globe. Yeah, the traction, exactly. It's kind of like the open surgery uh, that I don't use uh, retractors. I also don't use retractors uh, or protectors for the transorbital route. Just put in the endoscope and the instruments. Um, use some use a technique that I use is a chopstick technique. 
just uh, by, oh, um, I got to paste chopsticks here. Just, uh, <laughs> just by doing this, okay? So you see that by moving the chopsticks in and out, and with my left hand using endoscope, I can use um, uh, all the movement will be in line. So that is the technique and trick that, that we use to minimize any potential injury to the cranial nerves. And about if at all you have any injury to the tendon capsule and fat comes out, for the young I, neurosurgeon, what is the best way out? You take up some fat or like what, what you can suture the tendon capsule because you have the milk space there, what is the best right. way out? Right, the best way is of course to avoid it. Avoid breaking the the uh, capsule. So um, we use the endoscope quite early on. Um, if uh, one wants to start the transorbital route, um, the, uh, I, I would suggest you to uh, use the microscope first for the third section, for the first part, okay? And then sit, once you're in, and then you switch to the endoscope, that would be easier to start. Um, just using the naked eye, there is a risk of uh, uh, breaching the periorbital. Well, if it indeed being breached, if it's a small gap, it's okay. Um, uh, just leave it there. Uh, don't do anything. Uh, if it's a, a bit uh, a big that is coming out, you can use the bipolar to cauterize it. It will shrink. But never um, uh, take out the fat if you're not doing intracranial lesions. Otherwise, the fat will keep coming out and it's kind of endless. And um, it can also increase the risk of uh, having the um, optic um, nerve injury uh, because uh, the fat actually serves as cushion. So uh, God creates everything with purpose. So um, the, there's a periorbital fat, it's a protection uh, of the um, intraorbital content and the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery. So just leave it there if uh, we're doing lesions that is um, extra -conal. Of course, if we do intra lesions like um, 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 venous malformations, cavernous malformations inside the orbit, we have to remove some of the fat, but otherwise just keep it there. Thank you very much, Professor. Just a last question before I open it for the discussion. If at all it's not a camp if Shonoma, if at all it's a cavernous hemangioma, then what is your take on it? Would you still go transorbital or you, you, do you have any experience of transorbital or you feel safer to go transcranial, Professor? Yeah, we, we do have experience in uh, um, um, vascular uh, malformations. Uh, of course, the venous malformations, not the not the arterial um, um, uh, side of the malformations uh, like the ADMs, no. But for venous um, lesions, it is also a good approach. Uh, we can uh, shrink the capsule of the lesion, and then uh, we can um, uh, uh, take out uh, the lesion um, on block uh, as a whole. And um, um, concerning um, the... Uh, Bleeding control, um, if first of all, if the plane is right. So uh, the uh, venous bleeding from the cavernous sinus is actually minimal. Uh, for that case, it's uh, just a small amount of bleeding. Uh, if it does happen, just use some flow seal or some uh, surge seal, it can control the bleeding. Uh, and of course, for the, um, uh, it's not about the venous malformations, of course, the size matters. If you're talking about huge size, then of course, uh, I would just go for craniotomy. But for mid-size, that would be a good case for um, transorbital as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelvin and Dr. Ben. And may I request Dr. Ashish Kumar first and then Dr. George Lazar to make a few comments about, or maybe their experience of handling this kind of cases. First, Dr. Ashish Kumar, please, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Sachin. Um, I, I, I didn't speak before, but uh, I'll have to uh, thank everyone for the comments. Uh, and um, uh, I think it was an excellent talk by Dr. Salazar. Uh, and I was thinking how many times I have done the same. And I, for every slide, I thought, okay, maybe this I have not done. But I think every second slide mistakes we all do uh, because we, we keep on ignoring as neurosurgeons. We are so much focused on the job at hand that we... Uh, ignore most of these things and and they of course take a toll on your uh, you know uh, on your physical uh, health so uh, that was an excellent talk and uh, i'd like to thank dr pizad also for uh, for his generous comments dr calvin uh, it will be a pleasure um, uh, for uh, you know for the collaboration uh, and i will i think uh, when i saw your uh, approaches and i was thinking like 
Uh, probably these these will, these are the approaches which we have never explored. And in my experience, I, I, I have not done the lateral orbitotomy approaches much. If I have to uh, uh, approach an intraorbital uh, lesion, probably uh, we will uh, go through transcranial route because that's a familiar uh, territory. But I think uh, uh, after his talk, I, I, I think uh, there is there is enough uh, uh, evidence for getting an expertise into these tumors because I think they, they need specific kind of an experience and you need to have that training for intraorbital approaches. And in workshops, we don't see those very often. So uh, I, I'll be very keen in, uh, you know, uh, sending my residents or fellows who want to learn about intraorbital and endoscopic intraorbital approaches uh, to, to his place whenever we, we, we have that opportunity. So thank you so much for your uh, talks. And uh, it was very, very um, enlightening, I will say, for, for me as a surgeon. And um, again, thanks Sachin for doing this and thank you all for uh, having us. It was an excellent session uh, and, and we never know, like I, I didn't know how last two hours went by. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. George, could you please make a few comments or your experience about handling these kind of cases? Well, uh, I guess what Professor Ben and uh, Professor Calvin said, it's really the next step in evolution of a uh, intraorbital tumor surgery. Uh, as Professor, as she said, uh, we are used to do craniotomies and eventually in some risk patients with comorbidities, uh, like in the case I presented, we try to do a, a less invasive procedures, but I guess the endoscope will impose in some of these uh, pathologies. So actually, uh, while Professor Ben and, and Professor Calvin are doing, I think it's great. And I guess the, the most important thing is that maybe they work in a in a, in, a, in a team with the ophthalmologist, maybe with the anesthesiologist that can actually be helpful to, to, to provide, you know, like smaller incisions, like uh, correct uh, diagnosis uh, and, you know, to see all what we are doing with the endoscope, it's, it's really amazing. And, you know, that's the big thing I guess we have to change in Latin American because sometimes we do not have uh, these prepared, uh, for example, ophthalmologists that have a lot of experience, for example, in intra or extracoronal tumors. And sometimes they prefer to do it in, in another way, it's like directly through the, through the orbit, you know? And, you know, I think that would be incredibly important in the workshop, as you already did, to promote this kind of, of treatment. And uh, I guess it's a really good, a really good um, future uh, technology that we are going to be, uh, to be watching a lot and doing a lot. And of course, uh, I guess the training in the catheter is uh, of most importance. Uh, as I said, I don't think we have to practice on the patient. So I guess uh, there are some uh, simulators that uh, I don't know that, that I just read that can create a material like it would be like a tumor. So it would be nice to, to, to put them inside the, the, the calibrate dissection and perform the surgery with the endoscope. So it will help us a lot to have a lot of uh, more um, gain experience with the caliber so we can actually go and perform in our patients. But uh, I really want to appreciate and to be thankful for Professor Yoko Kata and all the work that she's doing, all the kind invitations of Sachin and uh, always the, the, the main support from Professor Prisad. And of course, uh, I really congratulate all the speakers. It was an amazing session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. George. Uh, Professor Fawad Pizat to make a comment about, about the status of intraorbital surgery and about uh, Dr. Bain's presentation. Uh, and if endoscope is not there, I would request Dr. Kelvin Mark, if endoscope is not there, how can we perform this kind of surgery in a low resource country? What is the way out? Can we design some small endoscope or maybe we can extend the approach and then we can get it there. First, Professor Fawad Pizad and then Dr. 
Yes, um, well, thank you. So, um, well, first of all, of course, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Coomers and uh, Salazar. It's a very kind comment and I'm always uh, welcome um, to uh, further collaborate and um, uh, let's um, uh, be friends and uh, we, we, we will meet together each other uh, after all this um, COVID thing. Yeah, so um, for the uh, question about uh, the lack of the uh, endoscope instrument, actually, uh, uh, Professor Salazar has um, already answered the question um, by showing the case. Uh, I think that uh, would be doing a chronic incision or a late crease incision, and then um, uh, use a uh, lateral orbitotomy approach. So uh, that would um, uh, increase the exposure. And then uh, afterwards, um, can because um, the temporal fossa is exposed, so it's all just muscle. And then you just uh, retract um, laterally uh, uh, the um, temporalis muscle, and then use a microscope uh, to perform the uh, surgery. Of course, um, the limitations need to be uh, considered um, if a uh, microscope is used instead of endoscope, that would be a microscopic uh, transorbital surgery. I would say uh, that would be quite useful for, for example, sphenoorbital meningiomas or some intraconal lesions. But um, if it requires a splitting of the cavernous sinus, or even um, um, by um, you know uh, going down deep down to the V two V three and drilling off the uh, anterolateral triangle, that might be the limitation by using endoscope instead of uh, I mean by using microscope instead of endoscope. So um, um, so in essence, it can be done, um, uh, but um, uh, um, but of course, using endoscope would be um, better, and uh, that can reach the um, limit um, further. Thank you very much. Dr. Fawad, could you make some comment? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ben and Jean, uh, for the uh, case report. Congratulations. And also, uh, Professor Calvin Mark, thank you. Uh, it was uh, very uh, successful cases, and uh, congratulations. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sachin told, that's a low uh, resource country like Afghanistan that we uh, haven't uh, microscope or and endoscope. It's very difficult, but uh, always I uh, discuss with our colleagues, with our young neurosurgeons, that's in the other world, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, resources and the equipments are uh, day by day change and uh, uh, I, I told them about the uh, equipment, uh, but unfortunately in Afghanistan, uh, we always do uh, by a transcranial approach uh, nowadays as well. And uh, now I hope that some days uh, we also equip with, with your help uh, but uh, advanced instruments and uh, think, uh, and also train our, uh, especially young colleagues with uh, new technology and advanced neurosurgery. Uh, uh, I hope you know, one day uh, we reach in this uh, vision and uh, maybe, maybe someday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fawad. You can see hand raised by Professor Ashish Kumar. Do you want to make any comment, Professor? Uh, yes, uh, Sachin. I just wanted to ask Professor Calvin Mack about his own learning curve in uh, uh, in endoscopic transorbital surgery. Uh, like, did he start with the endoscopic uh, uh, nasal surgery first? How many cases? Uh, and then when did you, uh, you know, uh, switched over to uh, the orbital surgery? It was initially microscopic and then endoscopic what was your own learning curve because uh, I, these tumors are rare um, number for first and foremost and uh, if you start with an endoscope directly with this approach there the, the might be issues so uh, what what is the right way to go about it thank you yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, yes, I, as, as I said, I started off with um, uh, microscop microscopic um, craniotomy uh, surgeries, and I still do it uh, uh, from uh, day in, day out. And I also got trained uh, using uh, endoscopic endonasal, um, got familiarized with the uh, surgical techniques, which is very useful 
to do surgery in a uh, long and narrow corridor. And then uh, I um, went to um, France uh, for um, a fellowship with um, uh, Sebastian Frodish, uh, and then I trained in his lab. Uh, that is the time that I started off with my experience uh, with uh, endoscopic uh, transorbital. So um, the cadaveric work, um, I would say there are two parts. The first part is to familiarize, familiarize with the anatomy uh, from craniotomy. And um, also with the um, using the uh, endonasal, um, extended and nasal procedures. And so that is important. Um, and of course, um, there are some um, territories that is quite um, unfamiliar to neurosurgeons like the infratemporal fossa and also the uh, pterygopalatine fossa. So that's where I uh, studied uh, a lot uh, of the anatomy there. And then um, I practiced in the cadavers um, around, I guess maybe 10-ish uh, uh, cadavers um, during my stay there. and. Um, uh, uh, and that's how I uh, start uh, back in Hong Kong. So, and I also collaborated with an um, um, ophthalmologist uh, who is a very good um, and experienced surgeon. So we kind of uh, do it uh, together. Uh, he helped with the um, skin incision. Uh, and then I do the uh, main part of the surgery. Um, in the beginning, we our case is uh, mainly restricted to uh, some uh, small sphenoid orbital meningiomas and um, small schwannomas. But um, as I said recently, we've actually expanded our um, um, indications to um, some head and neck tumors uh, like um, carcinomas, even sarcomas, and also for, for um, common lesions like a temporal tip meningiomas as well. So if um, you're familiar with the approach, um, uh, this approach can be very versatile. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelvin. Uh, Chen, you've got a hand raised. You want to say something? Uh, yes, thank you all. Uh, and uh, uh, regarding uh, the uh, technical, uh, uh, as a young neurosurgeon, uh, we have a few uh, opportunity to put our hands on the operation. Uh, to me, uh, how can I uh, learn the, um, the operation? Uh, I like to uh, sit, uh, sit in the operation and I watch my uh, senior uh, senior neurosurgeon and the chief uh, and I watch their um, um, operation technique step by step. And uh, at the same time, I read uh, the uh, rotten uh, textbook and I learn the anatomy. Uh, sure, before the surgery, uh, usually we will review the uh, anatomy. And, uh, uh, but to a young neurosurgeon, we have to uh, spend a long time to touch the uh, surgical table. And uh, so I like to uh, wait in the operation. And uh, just like uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Georgia said, uh, we, we are team, uh, we make the ro rotation. Uh, when uh, some one of the uh, surgery uh, need a rest and I can uh, <laughs> have the opportunity to put my hand on the surgical table. Uh, but uh, uh, regarding the uh, orbital approach, that's why I, I have no idea for the uh, uh, anatomy because my senior doctor never, never do this approach. Uh, just like uh, uh, what your teacher know and uh, your teacher teaches you. So how can we learn a new technique and uh, how can we practice by ourselves? So uh, for young neurosurgeon, usually we just uh, do the basic uh, work, too much basic work. Uh, uh, spend our time and uh, how can we have the opportunity to learn the high technique and then we can back to the uh, uh, clinic and then we can um, make some uh, practice in the clinical work. <laughs> how do you think this is a very um, uh, actual uh, situation? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. I think maybe Good. Ashish, or the, the, Dr. Ashish, maybe you can reply to her. Is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was myself speaking to uh, uh, Dr. Calvin just a few minutes before, and like, you know, what is what is the learning curve? How do you do that? Because in the in in the in the cadaveric workshops, you find very very uh, a few workshops offering intraorbital approaches. I, like I've seen skull bases, I've seen skull base approaches, I've seen uh, endoscopic endonasal uh, uh, workshops, but 
very rarely you will find intraorbital endoscopic approach. So I think this is a very novel uh, uh, area of field. And I think uh, the first thing is, of course, you, you have read about Rotten, you have read the textbooks, you know the anatomy. Then you uh, uh, try to uh, probably go to the uh, cadaveric workshops and and even when the cadaveric workshop is for skull base, you can still get an intraorbital approach. You can still ask a faculty to explore about the intraorbital approach, even if it's not in the program. So once you are done with your traditional approaches, you can specifically ask for intraorbital approaches. And if you have read it before, of course it helps. Uh, then the other thing which you need to know is like, uh, you know, you need to read about the articles, like the articles about these approaches. If there is a video which uh, Professor Kelvin can, uh, you know, a step-by-step -step video, which you, if he can share with you and you can obviously reach uh, back to him and, and then you will know, okay, this is the, this is, this is, these are the steps, right? Then it's only about uh, practicing on, on, on the cadavers. So as I said, just get into a workshop and, and, and try to get into those, uh, uh, you know, once you're finished with the main work, please try to get into, uh, you know, intraorbital approaches also, because, uh, because I, if you can get into specific intraorbital uh, um, uh, workshops, uh, like it will be great. But I don't know, Dr. Calvin, if if there are so many opportunities. What do you think? Like, if, do you do you have workshops which will offer uh, intraorbital approaches uh, specifically? Yeah, so we do actually. Uh, we we did a small scale uh, workshop um, last year, and actually we wanted to do it um, in a larger scale, but uh, it's because of the COVID situation, so we just stopped it. So we hopefully we can uh, run um, some kind of uh, this uh, transorbital workshops um, um, later. Uh, I know that there are some transorbital workshops uh, elsewhere, like in Spain and uh, another one in the States. Uh, um, they're upcoming, and um, there are actually a few neurosurgeons um, uh, to, around the world they're doing as well uh, like my friend uh, Kong uh, from Korea and um, and uh, uh, other groups as well so uh, yes there are opportunities and uh, one tip I would say is uh, to study uh, the 3D atlas uh, I still remember um, when I finished my um, training uh, in Paris and then fly back to Hong Kong uh, uh, it's a long it's a long haul flight uh, uh, 13 no it's 16 hours I think um, I spent a lot of time not uh, watching the movies. I skipped the movies. <laughs> I sacrificed the movies, but then I just took out my phone. I uh, used the upsearch on um, app. And then I find it very useful and interesting to just look at the 3D atlas and to rotate the, the uh, skull model and, the, and the, with the nerves and back and forth a, a long time there. So when I, I gained my um, understanding my 3D uh, anatomy there, uh, using another perspective apart from using cadaver, but also the 3D sense using the um, uh, 3D um, uh, atlas, which is very useful. And of course, um, nowadays you can uh, just read up uh, the anatomy and then the operative videos and um, a lot of literature, uh, and then uh, you can then publish. I mean, you can then practice in the uh, cadaver workshops. And also if you have got a lab in, in your um, workplace, that would be fantastic. Um, just doing the course is uh, too short of a duration, I would say. You need a practice and practice and practice in the, in the lab, especially for new approaches. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelvin. I think the last person and the best person will ask Dr. Ben, because he has gone through this training and he's still training and asking what is your experience, Dr. Ben? Can you yes. make some comments? Yes, I would like to feel, uh, make few comments or, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, Professor Chen's comment. And um, so, uh, yes, as a, one, as, as a young and new neurosurgeon, it's quite hard to learn the, the anatomy of trans, transorbital approach initially because it's, uh, it's quite new and it's not the traditional way that uh, we do. I understand the difficult situation that uh, sometimes we don't have our scalp, sometimes we don't have a cadaver to study the anatomy, and uh, and it's not a, a easy uh, surgical technique that you could practice at home. For example, for bypass surgery, like I could get a microscope at home and practice uh, suturing, and that that is uh, quite easy to do. But for this approach, is uh, different. So I start learning the anatomy by, uh, by uh, uh, reading the papers and also the Roton Atlas. So uh, you need to uh, have a, um, uh, familiarize yourself to the scalp anatomy of the orbit 
of the middle cranial fossa, the infratemporal fossa, and also the parapharyngeal fossa. And you study the anatomy of the temporal bone uh, uh, and, uh, and the sphenoid bone uh, very well. And, uh, and then you could uh, have the 3D uh, imagination of the whole anatomy inside your, inside your brain. And also by conducting the studies that uh, mentioned before, so you could uh, simulate uh, your craniotomy with the, uh, with the computer simulation, uh, which is also one of the way to learn as suggested by Professor Ashes. And uh, this one way that um, you try to make your uh, in this, uh, craniotomy in the computer. In that way, you could uh, familiarize your, uh, yourself with the uh, anatomy. And uh, also uh, to start off with the, uh, I, I think it's better to start off with uh, endoscopic uh, endolasal surgery so that you could have uh, a handling, better handling of the endoscope. And, uh, and uh, this is, uh, and then you switch to a higher level, uh, which is uh, uh, endoscopic translocal surgery. I think that's, that's, that's my way of trying to uh, understand and try to learn this approach. Thank you. Yeah, Thank of course, you. Uh, we, we, will, we will welcome you to join our, our, our cataphoric um, uh, uh, dissection if, if, we, if we are going to uh, host uh, later on after the COVID. And I think Kelvin uh, and I will be working on it and hopefully we'll get our lab um, done uh, very soon. It will be a great thing to do once the COVID is over, we can uh, get into uh, more and for cadaver training. So that will be a great idea. So it's almost been three hours we sitting and it was an excellent lecture. I did not understand how three hours passed by. Uh, so I would request uh, at the end, uh, Professor Yoko Kato to make a few comments and then we'll find up. Thank you very much for five speakers. I think uh, every every comment already, the, every, everybody uh, has already uh, said uh, in your lecture or, or discussion. I think uh, today's uh, webinar is uh, the studying from the anatomy and also the surgical technique and also the educational way and also the, the especially Byron uh, showed us uh, so many nice uh, points of the surgical, the small, small things. And uh, I think uh, besides the scientific uh, the, uh, point, uh, the, the, this kind of the communication is very, very important, I think, in the future. So we should continue uh, the, our, especially the, uh, today, I, I, we don't see the, so many, the YNS. Maybe we can uh, advertise uh, maybe a, one or two months before, then we can more uh, the audience. Thank you very much. But uh, thank you so much, to Sachin and you, and uh, organizing such a wonderful the uh, webinars. By Byron, thank see you, you tomorrow <laughs> again. Yes, yes. <laughs> see you. See you. Have a nice night. Yes. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At, at, at the end, I just wanted to show you and make an announcement yes. of uh, of one thing. Uh, we're going to have the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeon. Young Neurosurgeon Committee is going to conduct one dedicated conference, a three days virtual conference dedicated only for the young neurosurgeon, medical student and resident. A three days of festival just dedicated for the training because of the COVID we're not able to travel and all that fun is missing. So here is the short promotional video.
one minute. So that's about uh, this uh, conferences. So we're going to have uh, three days of conference. Uh, yeah. So this is what is the uh, tentative flyer. It will be on the 6th, 7th, and 8th of May, 2022. And uh, we're going to have virtual workshop on cystinostomy, on uh, endovascular uh, neurosurgery, on the cadaver neuroanatomy, bypass techniques, aneurysm clipping, and spine surgery from the experts of that particular field to know about their particular life in neurosurgery. Our great, great legions and mentors are going to spare some time and discuss with us. And plenary session uh, with uh, a few more uh, well-known neurosurgeons. Subcommittee session where a dedicated session for the medical student, dedicated session for the uh, women in neurosurgery and all the alumni from the Fujita University. A special session to talk on research in neurosurgery, collaboration of the Intercontinental Wireless Committee, the challenges of neurosurgery in low and middle income countries and newer technologies, and the experts of uh, 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 of all the neurosurgical aspects are going to teach us uh, the challenges and train us, train the young neurosurgeon about the aspects of that particular neurosurgical aspects. So this will be on 6th and 6th, 7th, 8th May. We're going to have a dedicated session for the young neurosurgeon award session, wherein I would request you and your resident to send in the uh, their abstract. Professor Yoko Kato has been very generous and kind enough to offer them uh, the uh, free publication of uh, their papers into our official journal of uh, Asian Journal of Neurosurgery to be the member of Asian uh, uh, Congress of Neurological Science uh, uh, Young Neurosurgeons Committee and uh, a prize money of 1,000 US dollars. So I request you all to send your abstract and to participate and enjoy this, uh, this neurosurgical festival. Thank you very much. From next time, we will advertise more and we'll get in more participants. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. You. So see you. Thank you. Thank see you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.